Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome. Everybody smile for me and wave just so I don't feel so lonely over here. Good to see you all. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, my name is Stephanie Villaforte, uh, and I just want to welcome you uh, to uh, the Colorado Mandatory Reporting Task Force. Uh, I will be serving as chair of the task force over the next two years, and uh, it's just a pleasure to see all of you here today. Um, before I begin, I just want to thank you all for your service. You volunteered for this, um, and it is a critically important conversation. Uh, each of you brings just tremendously um, unique uh, and important experience, and uh, I'm just looking so forward uh, to speaking to all of you, learning about you, and of course, tackling uh, the subject matter that's in front of us. So we have an agenda, um, and I just want to confirm just by a raise of hands, this is going to be a physical activity thing because I, I can't, we aren't in a room. Uh, just show of hands, everybody got a copy of their agenda, um, some background information, excellent, great. All right, friends, well, we are going to go ahead and start with some just some basic introductions so you can relax a little bit, um, keep drinking your coffee. Uh, I am going to go ahead and start and then I will be introducing our facilitators. Uh, you really are in for a treat. Uh, we have uh, two really dynamic groups with us today who will be helping us for the next two years. Uh, put together these conversations. Um, and uh, we will also then be, of course, asking all of you um, to introduce yourselves, but that'll come in about 20 minutes. So keep your coffee on. Uh, so again, welcome. Uh, my name is Stephanie and I serve as Colorado's Child Protection Ombudsman. I have served in this role for the uh, last seven years. And I'm gonna take a moment and just sort of give a, a primer on what the Ombudsman Office does. Um, we are a relatively new state agency. And while I have worked with, I would say at least half of you on this screen, maybe a little bit more, there are others that I have not had the privilege of working with. And so I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, <clears throat> just by way of starting, um, our office is an independent state agency. Uh, we have been uh, in state government since 2010. Uh, and we currently are an independent state agency housed in the state judicial branch. Uh, the judicial branch has a number of independent state agencies, and I believe we are one of eight of those at this time. Um, you know, just a little bit about ombudsman offices uh, in general. Uh, ombudsman offices uh, exist all over the world. Uh, there are a lot of different type of ombudsman offices, right? There are ombudsmen who help citizens in the child protection arena, much like my agency does. There are others who work on roads and bridges. There are others who work in hospitals to help patients. Um, there are those who work in higher education to bridge communication between students and professors. Uh, and so the ombudsman profession has been around literally hundreds of years. Um, child protection ombudsman offices um, in the United States are a relatively new creation. And really our job as ombudsmen are really supposed to be, we serve as objective uh, and neutral problem solvers for people who call our agency. Uh, in our case, uh, people call our office um, with concerns about the child protection system. Uh, generally, they will call with concerns about a child. It can be a foster parent looking for additional resources for the child in their care. It could be a parent asking for additional education or resources um, about their experience in the child protection system. We get calls from teachers, behavioral health specialists, uh, law enforcement. Uh, and the idea is that we really work with citizens to help reserve or resolve their concerns at the lowest level. Uh, we don't fire people. We don't issue tickets. Uh, we don't have any authority, um, you know, that would resemble sort of a law enforcement activity, if you will. Um, the job is really just to give citizens immediate service and try to help them uh, in these really critical questions they have about a child or their own family. In the last year, uh, we have we got about a thousand such calls a year, and again, they span a multitude of industries that are designed to um, take care of children and ensure their well-being. Uh, we have about a dozen staff members 
And, you know, I, again, I always emphasize the fact that our job is to be neutral. When people call us, we don't advocate or represent a party in that instance. Again, uh, we work to really bring parties together to communicate and, again, uh, get to some resolution. Our services are free. They're confidential. And um, from those calls that we get, we do a lot of tracking, which leads us to our conversation here today on mandated reporting. Uh, every call that we get, we identify a trend in that case um, so that we can really learn from our individual citizens who call and work on the bigger system concerns. Um, the law requires us to do both. We not only take individual citizen calls, but then we're supposed to translate that uh, into recommendations for system change. That could be legal change. It can be regulatory change. Um, it could be recommendation for practice. So um, that is actually our statutory charge. And in this case, what brings us here today uh, is really the notion that uh, over the past several years, uh, we have consistently received a number of phone calls uh, from mandated reporters with a number of questions. Um, it can be everything from how soon am I supposed to report my, uh, make my mandatory report. It can be to whom do I report. It can be, am I supposed to report or is my agency, a hospital or a school supposed to report for me? You name it, we have received dozens of such questions over the years. And that led us to really, again, decide we need to look at Colorado's mandatory reporting law. Um, you know, our law, we were one of the very first in the country. Uh, in 1963 to create a mandatory reporting law. Uh, the laws have proliferated across every state uh, nationally, as you all well know. And, you know, the real question for this task force is, you know, is that law effective, right? Is it doing all that we need it to do for the people it was intended to help? Um, and that, I will tell you, you are really one of the first task force in the nation, the entire country to tackle this question in this manner. And so I just want to congratulate you all um, and thank you for, for serving on this important uh, mission, if you will. It's a big question uh, and it's going to be very complicated, but I'm also pleased that we have the resources that will allow us to do a good job. The offshoot of the trends that we saw again was that we issued a brief, a public facing brief. And in that brief, it was uh, published uh, in 2021, it focused very heavily on the technical aspects of the mandatory reporting law. And it did so for a very specific reason. Those were the issues that were brought to our agency. And so those were the issues we highlighted in that brief. However, while the brief focuses primarily on those technical aspects, I think it's critically important to know that as well as you, you are all aware, there is a much broader conversation that is happening nationally about the effectiveness of these laws. Um, do they keep children safe as we intended them to, right? Um, is there even empirical evidence of that fact? Um, there's also a very large and important conversation that's going on about the disproportionate impact of mandatory reporting laws on communities of color, uh, communities with low socioeconomic status, and even our disabled populations. Uh, and, and finally, a, a really? third conversation that's taking place is, do mandatory reporting laws sweep too many families into the child welfare system when they might require help or assistance in a number of other ways, whether that's food, um, economic assistance, housing assistance. Um, and so those are the three very large themes um, that are going on nationally that we will obviously be uh, discussing uh, here in this task force as well. You um, are looking at your colleagues. There are 34 of you who serve on this task force, all from a variety of uh, backgrounds and education. Um, as you know, um, I think Colorado's child abuse mandated reporters, I think we're up to 41 on the list right now. And so um, in large part, those are all the individuals that you see in front of us here today, um, as well as individuals in our community who have been impacted by these laws. You received in your packet um, really just a list of the directives that the law requires us to tackle. There are 19 such directives, and I'm not going to read those through for you here today, but you have all of that information uh, contained in your Dropbox link. 
Uh, we will be meeting 13 times over the next two years, which if you think about it, is not that much time to tackle a law that's been around for you know five decades um, and has had a lot of impact in our community uh, and also is designed to incorporate the national conversation as well. Uh, so um, we have a lot of work to do, but fortunately for us, we have a lot of assistance with us today. Uh, the, the final task we have um, is that we are required to produce a report uh, for the General Assembly. That report is due in January of 2025. Uh, and again, uh, we will be having a, a great deal of assistance uh, in order to produce that report. So I am going to stop there and I will take any questions before I go ahead and turn it over to um, Jennifer Saperka, who is our uh, Ombudsman Policy uh, Director. And then of course, we wanna turn it over to both of our facilitating groups. Are there any questions? And uh, I'm gonna need some assistance if there are, cause I'm looking at four screens of people and I don't see any virtual hands. All right. Terrific. Okay. So with that, um, I just want to uh, note that in terms of um, the Ombudsman Office, uh, we have a number of our staff members on the screen today. If you would just hold up your hand um, and just wave to everybody. <clears throat> This is the group who makes all the magic happen. Uh, these are the folks that um, have really helped form the backbone of this project. They are the ones who have taken literally hundreds and hundreds of citizen calls. They help us identify issues and that allows us to bring these issues to you. Um, so I wanna thank all of them that are here today. Um, they're instrumental to the work that we do on a daily basis as well as a systemic basis. Uh, I also want to then turn it over to you, Jennifer, if you would describe just your role here at our agency, as well as the process um, that we have designed. Um, we have taken very particular care to make sure that all of you have the resources that you need in order to answer some of these very complicated topics. And Jennifer is our point person uh, for amassing a lot of that research. So Jen, if you would give us um, some background on what we can expect, that'd be great. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. Um, Stephanie failed to mention that I'm the new director of legislative affairs and policy. I just joined the office in mid-November. Um, so I'm going to claim that new that newness for quite a while. <laughs> um, just a little bit of background. I most recently came from an education nonprofit. So my role was partnership director where we brought together stakeholders to um, learn and share practices to improve education and career outcomes for uh, underserved students. Um, and then prior to that, I helped run a public policy think tank out of the University of Denver, which is where I met Stephanie. Um, we would examine big policy issues like immigration and campaign finance reform. Um, and it was a it was a model similar to this where we brought people with various experiences to be members of our panel. Um, we brought in experts, we provided research, um, and then they would um, you know take that information, contribute their own expertise. Um, discuss what they had heard and then come up with findings and produce a report. So this process is familiar to me. Um, this particular uh, process is uh, very unique, I think, in that um, you all are, you know, working in or adjacent to the child welfare system. Um, and we're looking at very specific issues. Um, and like Stephanie mentioned, you know, mandatory reporting is an issue that hasn't you know, in this state, we we probably haven't taken that nuts and bolts look at um, in quite a while. So this this represents an amazing opportunity. Um, so our office serves as the new, neutral convener. Uh, we partner with Keystone Policy Center, who will uh, introduce themselves uh, next. Um, so they'll provide facilitation and meeting support um, and assistance in generating that final report. So we will provide structure to the process, um, you know, and again, we'll provide research and articles, reports, summaries, as well as curriculum to follow uh, that will help guide our discussions as we, as we go through this process. And we wanna make sure that we fulfill the directives in the statute as well as respond to task force member inquiries. So as you're asking questions, we are all keeping track. Um, we also invite members of the public to attend these meetings. So for those of you who are not on the task force, thank you for attending. 
Uh, we hold space for you at the end of each meeting to contribute your thoughts and questions. And all of this information will contribute uh, to the development of, of our final report that Stephanie mentioned. Um, and we'll, of course, present that back to the uh, task force before um, it's published. Um, so next, I think um, I'm introducing Keystone. So we have um, Barrick and Trace. Um, we have also um, brought in um, Doris Tolliver. Sorry, I'm like looking at a screen full of people. Um, and everyone has these amazing experiences. So Barrick, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And Stephanie, Jennifer, and Jordan, the opportunity to support you all. Uh, my name is Barrick Abramson. I'm Senior Policy Director at the Keystone Policy Center. Uh, and I do want to give you just a thumbnail on us, but then we want to get into the work, but I want you to understand who we are and who the team is here. Uh, the Keystone Policy Center is a nonpartisan organization that was founded in 1975 by a gentleman named Bob Craig, who went on to be the first executive director at the Aspen Institute. And Bob said there has to be a better way than everybody hiring expensive lawyers and lobbyists and fighting it out under the gold dome. What if we could get everybody together and actually have respectful conversations and find some common ground that could serve the common good. So since 1975, that's exactly what Keystone has done. And while we are based in Keystone, we have an office in Denver and an office in DC and work nationally. Uh, we've had the good fortune to support different offices in this state government on a number of issues ranging from fiscal policy and transportation policy to quite a bit of work around education, energy policy, and a number of issues of us, uh, relating to youth and youth services. Um, our role here is to ensure that we have all voices being heard and that they're heard equitably. So we're going to be working with our partner, who I'll introduce in just a minute, to make sure that you all have the opportunity to hear from who you need to, that you're all in an environment where you feel comfortable raising your unique opinion, and it's done in a respectful way, where we can all work towards bringing each person's unique perspectives, expertise, lived experience, and professional and personal experience to bear on the issues we're trying to tackle here. I'll have my team introduce themselves, and then I'm going to be really excited to introduce our partner, Doris, on all of this. Uh, but first, Trace, and then Callie, if you, you would introduce yourself. Hi, all. Uh, Trace House with Keystone Policy Center. Uh, honored to be here. Uh, I know that I, I, I see some familiar faces with some other work we've done and also a lot of new faces. So um, I'll be on, on each call and really excited about the timeline we have set out here to do some really meaningful work. So uh, grateful to, to be here and to support you all in this work. And I'll hand it over to Callie. Good morning, all. Callie King Newman, um, project manager at Keystone Policy Center, and um, like Trace and Barrick, very excited to be here with you all um, working on this task force for the next two years. I will be brief and send over to Doris. Actually, and before oh, we bring Barrick. in, uh, all good, Callie. Thank you both very much. Uh, and I just want to, you know, explain the partner that I, I'm really excited to introduce. Um, our team here at Keystone, uh, as you might guess, has pretty deep roots in Colorado. And we think a pretty deep understanding of the different dynamics at play uh, across the state and state government and local government and in our nonprofit uh, and our supporting communities. Um, we are really excited, though, to partner with Doris Tolliver from Health Management Associates. Um, Doris brings a really amazing national perspective. She spent more than a decade at the Indiana Department of Child Services. She was uh, worked with the Child Welfare Strategy Group at the Annie Casey Foundation. Um, and just has a wealth of expertise on the issues that we're going to be tackling. Uh, so our team is thrilled to play kind of an operational and state context role uh, and to partner with Doris on, on the expertise of the issues uh, and in facilitating these conversations. So Doris, I'll, I'll hand it off to you next. Awesome. Thank you, Barrick. Um, so uh, again, Doris Tolliver, I think uh, Barrick already did sort of like a, I think a really good introduction of, of my background. I'm really excited uh, to join with all of you um, in looking at um, mandatory reporting, um, both the um, sort of the, the, the law itself um, and how it plays out in practice and, and impacts kids and families. I think the thing that I will add in terms of uh, my background for the better, better part of my career, I have swirled around um, in child welfare, um, working with organizations that um, directly in child welfare. Um, as Barrick mentioned, I spent uh, 10 years in, in uh, Indiana's Public Child Welfare Agency, um, and then since then have been consulting in um, directly with child welfare agencies and those working adjacent. Uh, so, and, and prior to my, my state experience, um, again, I swirled around 
um, working on behalf of uh, marginalized populations um, that either had some child welfare involvement or at risk for child welfare involvement. Um, so this is an area that I love. Uh, one of the areas that, um, that I also bring some particular expertise around is uh, looking at and thinking about um, equity along the continuum, uh, again, in and adjacent to the child welfare uh, system. So uh, wanting to be really intentional with this group and sort of thinking about the, the impacts of, of reporting laws on various subpopulations and ensuring that uh, whatever recommendations come from this group uh, really have equity centered um, in them. So it is uh, an honor and a pleasure uh, to join with all of you. And I'm looking forward to uh, meaningful conversations and ultimately uh, some recommendations that I think will, um, will have a positive impact on kids and families across the state of Colorado. Well, thank you, Dorsa. I think at this point um, we can pivot it and now it's time for us to start doing a lot more listening than talking. Uh, so I'll let Doris and Trace run us through. We wanna get to know all of the task force members before we do that, just a little bit of a technical and administrative ask though. Um, we have a very large task force that is getting to know each other. We also have a lot of members of the public joining us to, to listen in and learn. Um, so what I would ask members of this task force, if you are in a place where it is safe and you are comfortable doing so, we would love to have you on video for most of the meeting. I realize you may have to take a, a brief pause here and there, but we'd love to have you on video so that we can see you and everybody can get to know you. Members of the public, we're thrilled that you're interested in this issue and that you've joined to listen in. Uh, we would, however, ask that you turn your video off so that members of the task force can focus on one another. At 1140, we do have time blocked for public comment, and we'll ask you to uh, raise your hand at that time or to use the chat to talk to the host so we know that you're a member of the public who would like to speak. But until then, we'd like to ask task force members videos on so we can see those faces. Members of the public, we're thrilled you're here to listen, but we'd ask you to turn those cameras off so the members can focus on one another. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Doris and Trace so we can get to know the members of this group and they get to get to know one another. Perfect, thanks, Barrick. And Doris, I'm happy to jump in since I have the list working, if that works for you. Ah, oh, fantastic, thank you. Okay, perfect. So like Barrick said, yeah, or, well, like everyone said, I think one of, the th one of the advantages we have is that we do have some time for this group to really get to know one another. And, you know, unlike some other task forces we've worked on, we are not on this fast sprint where we are like jumping in and moving at 100 miles per hour. So we really want to get to uh, to listen to all of you and to understand who you are and what brought you here. So I just want to name two things. One, we're going to go around to each person right now, and I'm just going to go down the list. Uh, and then at the end, if I'm missing someone, please let me know. Um, and really right now, uh, we're going we're gonna to get into more questions. But right now, the question is, who are you? What uh, kind of, you know, share uh, what uh, perspective you're representing here, who you're representing. And then the the quick key question is, what brought you to this task force? Why are you here? Just on a personal note, like what, what made you say, I would love to wake up and be here at 8 a.m. Uh, and participate in this large group Zoom call. So I'm going to start at the top of my list, again, introducing yourself and, and what brought you to this task force. And let's start with, and, 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 and also if I say your name incorrectly, please correct me and we'll make a note here for myself moving forward. Um, I'm gonna start with Adriana Hartley. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, so my name is Adriana Hartley. I'm out here on the Western Slope in Delta, Colorado. I'm an assistant county attorney who works for the Delta County ah, Attorney's ah, Office. Ah. So that is the um, unique perspective that I hope to represent well here today. Uh, you know, I started my legal career with an emphasis on equal access to justice. And so looking at the mandatory reporting laws really struck um, an interest of mine because I felt like it was a good opportunity to sway or perhaps review the law to make sure that it is equally applied and that there is equal access to individuals who want to make reports. Um, you know, there is a lot of people that just are hesitant and scared because there's perception or perceived um, ramifications from doing such. And so I just want to make it a better procedure for everybody because I think when people have a safe outlet to turn to, the departments in general across the state can really have a better outcome um, in serving families and getting to investigating uh, potential 
issues. Thanks, Adriana. I appreciate you being here. All right, um, Ashley Chase, who are you and what brought you here? Hello, I am a staff attorney and the legislative liaison at the Office of the Child's Representative. So for those that are not familiar, we're the state agencies that oversees all the attorneys who represent children and youth in dependency, neglect, and juvenile delinquency and truancy cases. Um, and I'm really here kind of for two reasons. The first is probably the least important, but the most technical is this potentially has the impact on our ability to use multidisciplinary legal teams, which is something we feel is really important and beneficial to children and youth in the system. But more importantly, our agency is really invested in addressing the disparities that we see in the child welfare system. And we feel like this is a really vital piece uh, to starting to address that. So really happy to be involved in the conversation. Thanks, Ashley, appreciate you being here. Um, Brenna Segrin. Hi, I'm Brenna Segrin. Um, I'm the COO of Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Denver. Um, I am bringing the perspective of the after school community and the out of school community. Um, we are often uh, the first line defense of creating safe spaces when parents are still at work. Um, and so having done some work with our national organization on child safety issues, and then also the US Center for Safe Sport, this is just really where my passion is. And it's a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, but also joining because there's a lack of clarity in regards to expectations in the current environment. And how do we expect professionals to meet their legal duty? Um, and how do we guide that with equity and raising the standard of care for all kids? Um, so really excited to be here and to work on this topic. Great, thanks, Brynja, I appreciate it. Um, moving on to Colleen O'Neill. Yes, good morning, I'm Colleen O'Neill. I'm the Associate Commissioner of Educator Talent at the Colorado Department of Education. Um, and uh, this falls you know, squarely into teachers' realms. They are often uh, with our kids more than anyone else um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And so there is, um, to kind of piggyback on what other people have said, there's sometimes lack of clarity and especially in that um, chain of command within a school structure, there's a lot of confusion um, sometimes at our schools as to who the mandatory reporter is and what their responsibilities are. So um, I'm excited about the opportunity to provide clarity within that um, and the clear structures around ensuring that there is equity in those reporting measures and what that looks like across that continuum for all of our educators. So um, thank you for allowing this to happen. And I'm excited about the opportunity to make sure this, this is a full force for our educators. Thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Appreciate you being here. I'm going to move on to Kristen Menz. Hi, I go by Chris. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker in Otero County. Um, I have private practice and I'm also contracted within the school districts um, for um, East Otero and Rocky Ford school districts. A um, lot of disparities out here, a lot of barriers. Um, and as reporting goes up, because we do have social workers in the school contracted right now, um, we don't seem to be getting the results that we would like to see. Um, and we continue to make repetitive reports. Um, I'd like to get more clarity on like standards of emotional abuse and all of that, because it seems very difficult to um, remove children or get help for the parents if it's an emotional case even though from a clinical standpoint, we see the most damage in our kids from constant emotional abuse or Stockholm syndrome, so to speak, of being told they're whatnot. Um, so um, just again, clarity, maybe resources, because again, our tools are so limited here. We have minimal resources, minimal funding, and just see where I can help change our process. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for being here. And I'm loving your cozy office vibes too, as well. Uh, um, all right, moving on to Dawn Alexander. Hi, everyone. My name is Dawn Alexander, and I'm the executive director of the Early Childhood Education Association of Colorado. We are a statewide trade association for child care businesses. And so what we consistently hear 
from our membership is that people um, are told by their industry that they must do a report and they call the county and the county goes, why are you calling us? <laughs> and so if we can, can add some logic to that equation or some very clear indicators that would make a difference so that people know exactly when to call um, in our industry, that would be tremendous. Thanks, Don. Uh, moving on to Donna Wilson. Good morning. My name is Dr. Donna Wilson. I am representing WellPower, which is formerly the Mental Health Center of Denver. I'm also a licensed professional counselor and have been in the state of Colorado since 2000. Um, I'm here for many reasons. The main reason that piqued my initial interest is that I was the first principal for the Colorado Child Welfare Training System and helped to write that mandatory reporter curriculum. So I wanna figure out how we fell short. I need to you know, figure out how, what we can do better to mitigate disparate outcomes. Um, that that's my niche, DEI, and um, all things systems improvement. So I'm here to figure out how to help Colorado do it a little differently. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. Appreciate you being here. Um, Ida Drury. Hi there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, my name is Ida Drury, and I'm currently uh, working at the Kemp Center. Um, uh, picking up on Donna, we've continued carrying the torch at Kemp uh, related to the training of mandated reporters. And so I certainly am coming here um, from the standpoint of, of doing that work better. I think um, my career has been rooted in child welfare. I've been doing this work since uh, 2005. Um, either as direct practice and then in state administration, um, subsequently uh, doing consulting uh, nationally and in the territories related to child welfare screening. Um, I come at this from a professional lens, but I also am bringing a, a bit of a personal lens to the table. I, I grew up in a community, uh, a small community, rural, uh, under-resourced, so to speak. Um, and um, I had parents with developmental disabilities and um, they were successful uh, in raising me, not through the involvement of child welfare, uh, but through the involvement of a strong community uh, surrounding our family um, through, through my entire childhood to the point of becoming a first gen um, college student and subsequently going on to get my PhD. And so my passion um, is on the, what I believe is the misdirection of the mandatory reporting uh, laws to suss out a disproportionate uh, number of children and families of color from disadvantaged communities um, and uh, parents uh, with uh, disabilities. And so um, really committed the, my career to, um, to pursuing equity and I'm excited to lead the nation in doing that here in Colorado uh, as well with our, our mandatory reporting uh, work. So happy, very happy to be here. Very happy to have you. Thanks, Ida. Appreciate it. Um, moving on to Jade Woodard. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jade Woodard. I am the executive director of Illuminate Colorado. Illuminate is the uh, prevent child abuse chapter for the state of Colorado. Um, so as that implies, I am bringing a prevention lens to this conversation, really wanting to think about opportunities to um, refer families to support services prior to involvement with child welfare, um, and really just explore all that our mandatory reporter and really promotion of mandatory reporting does to um, instill fear in families and, and potentially keep them from seeking support or resources that they need to avoid child welfare system involvement. Um, I'm also really curious about the line between um, and we're doing a lot of work on the line between poverty and when kind of poverty is the determining or the leading thing that a family is is struggling with and how that leads to involvement in the child welfare system when maybe child welfare system isn't actually the support that that family needs in order to be well and take care of their kids. So very, very excited to be here as a part of this conversation and look forward to all we will do together. Thanks, Jade. Appreciate you being here. Um, moving on to Jennifer Isle. Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Isle. I'm really happy to be here with you all. And um, 
I am a licensed professional counselor and an attorney. I'm the executive director of Project Safeguard. We are an organization that provides civil legal advocacy to victims of gender-based violence, including domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Uh, Stephanie and I worked together at the Rocky Mountain Children's Law Center when I was there several years ago. Um, <clears throat> I have worked as a, a victim advocate and a therapist, and then later an attorney uh, with survivors since about 1995. I've been a child and family investigator, uh, attorney serving on behalf of victims, a uh, guardian ad litem, um, and I've done a lot of training around the state for folks trying to work in the civil legal system on behalf of survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Um, so I'm really excited to be here because the, the overlap between domestic violence and child welfare is a tremendous interest of mine, a tremendous concern of mine. And I know many of you have been part of other task forces addressing those specific intersections. Um, but the impact of mandatory reporting laws on victims of domestic violence in particular and their children is the reason that, that I'm here. And we have research that shows that mandatory reporting laws discourage survivors from seeking the help they need and actually leave children in dangerous situations. Uh, so I'm excited to have these conversations and really see how we can make this mandatory reporting law serve children and um, their adult protective parents better. Thanks, Jennifer, for being here. And also I'm, I'm loving your lavender vibes over there, the purple. It's it's coming through strong, so I appreciate. Thanks, thanks. I try to make sure my, my clothes don't match my background too much, but it does it does happen. They are my favorite colors. You, yeah, you pulled it off today. I love it. <laughs> All right, moving on. A familiar face, Jessica, daughter. Good to see you. Hey, Trace. Good to see you too. I was happy to see um, everybody from Keystone is on this task force. Uh, my name is Jessica Daughter. I am the sexual assault resource prosecutor at the Colorado District Attorney's Council. Um, I hold kind of a unique position in this state um, and I think in the country. I don't think very many states have a sexual assault resource prosecutor, but essentially um, I was a DA for uh, about almost a decade before I came here and now I work really for the state and um, support all 22 districts um, and all in terms of their district attorneys and really focus in on being the glue um, for the sexual assault prosecutors. So help them with training, resources, policy, consult, dip in on trials um, um, here and there when I'm needed to for big complex um, sex assault cases. But I'm really happy to be here. I um, was um, involved in some of the uh, legislative work that made this task force happen um, and talked with the sponsors about it when the bill was coming about. So I was really excited to see the direction they went with it and all the stakeholders um, that are here today to really, well, for the next two years, um, to give input on this important topic. I wanted to be on this task force because um, obviously as a prosecutor, I kind of deal with mandatory reporters in, in a couple of different ways. They're oftentimes the very first outcry for survivors. Um, and so uh, I think it's vital that they be trained on um, things like domestic violence, on sexual assault sort of dynamics, um, and that they be given the support that they need to be able to properly do their jobs um, in those trusted positions with kids. Um, and the other side, of course, is um, unfortunately that sometimes they're prosecuted for failing to do those jobs. And I want to make sure because I, like you all, agree that there is so much confusion over what the duties actually are. Um, we want to make sure that the public is and that these people in positions of trust are aware of those duties and that those are clear um, so that they don't fall into situations um, where you know they end up on that side of, of the DA's office. Um, I also think it's vital that we talk about and that they are trained on implicit bias. I think that it touches every part of the system. Um, and I wanna make sure that this is not, uh, you know, we can get to a place where we're improving and decreasing that disproportionate impact on certain populations. Um, I, I, so I think I share a lot of the same um, hopes here and I really look forward to working with you all and sharing the perspective of prosecuting attorneys. Thanks, Jessica, I appreciate, appreciate you being here. 
Uh, moving on to Catherine Wells. Good morning, everyone. Um, my I go by Kathy. I am um, by training a pediatrician and um, subspecialty trained in child abuse pediatrics. Um, I am currently serving as the executive director of the Kemp Center and the section head for child abuse pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics, University of Colorado. Um, our clinical side of practice is Children's Hospital Colorado, and so I still do clinical work and lead a clinical team. And um, really here with the lens of healthcare providers, particularly uh, those that provide pediatric care, but really this could be anyone that's providing care uh, where someone uh, may have contact with children. And uh, I, uh, that, so I, that's what I really uh, fundamentally who I am as a person as a pediatrician first. Um, and I've been doing this for uh, as child abuse pediatrician for 20 years. But prior to that, even in a small community as a general pediatrician, understanding the complexities that health providers have when it comes to um, advocating for their children and their families in a very unique way. It's a very trusted relationship. Um, there's a lot of fear often that will go on with uh, if, if uh, a report is made, what may occur to that relationship where there may be some protection and some support for a family. I can recall many cases as a young general pediatrician where I had, uh, knowing what I know now, I probably should have made a report, but really engaging with the family in a positive way was able to avoid that. So um, some fundamental lens there, I think, um, and um, also the uh, previous past president of the Colorado chapter of the American, American Academy of Pediatrics. And so we'll sort of bring that lens. Um, on the flip side, I also acknowledge um, leading the Kemp Center that Dr. Kemp uh, many years ago wrote a paper about uh, really horrific, violent physical abuse that was honestly in front of a, a lot of um, physicians was, uh, was uh, booed out of the room when he uh, brought this issue that children could be harmed and by people that are caring for them. And I, really that's where some of the mandatory reporting um, fundamentally began and now recognizing that the impact and the way that um, uh, these laws are put into place, um, also understanding the disparities uh, that occur and really appreciating that some of that disparity occurs before uh, the, case, the situation ever hits the door of child welfare. Um, so for the past 20 years, having spent um, all of my time really committed to the complexities of families and children at risk uh, as a physician, um, what I really hope to bring to this is that sort of broader lens of the challenges for healthcare providers, but also um, my experience and sort of that journey of uh, seeing the complexities of reporting, but also understanding the impact uh, and oftentimes unintended impact it has for families. Um, so really committed to, to that part of the uh, diversity equity uh, conversation as well. So really, really happy to be here and, and uh, excited to work with all of you and, and meet those that I haven't met yet. Really happy to have you. Thanks, Kathy and Dr. Wells, appreciate it. Uh, moving on to Kevin Bishop. Hi, thank you. My name is Kevin Bishop. I am the social worker coordinator for the Office of the Alternate Defense Council. Um, we are the conflict council for the public defender's office. So when the public defender can't represent somebody, our office does. Um, I have been in mental health for the last 22 years, uh, broadly, and then in uh, public defense for the last 17 years, uh, starting in Baltimore, uh, Maryland, and then here in Colorado. This issue is really important uh, to us and to our agency and our clients who are represented. And I'm super interested in the intersection of the mandatory uh, reporting law and the constitutional, uh, constitutional rights of our clients. And um, also all of the equity stuff that people have mentioned, I do feel like this issue impacts uh, both communities living in poverty and communities of color uh, disproportionately. And I'm really excited to talk about those things. Thanks, Kevin, for being here. Appreciate it. Um, Leanna, Gavin. 
Good morning. My name is Leanna Gavin. Um, I am an associate at Kalamea Gosha. We are a law firm that has offices across the state of Colorado. Um, I personally am located in Denver and I practice family law. So I uh, represent parents in divorces and child custody cases. And my role on the task force is, is really to bring that perspective um, of, of those parents and the attorneys who represent them. Um, but my lens is really shaped by a, a number of other experiences and roles that I've played in the child welfare system. Previously to uh, practicing family law and private practice, I was um, an RPC, a respondent parent counsel, representing parents in dependency and neglect cases here in Colorado. Um, I also specialized in juvenile and family law in law school. So I, I also played a GAL role on a couple of cases in as a student attorney when I was in law school. And prior to that, I was a CASA um, in Arkansas. And so I have been in the role of having to uh, make a, a report as a mandatory reporter and um, the role of representing the best interests of the child. And I've also been in the role of representing parents. And I've, I've seen how um, the mandatory reporting laws and, and policies and practices can have that disparate impact that so many others have talked about today um, on, you know, poor families living in poverty, families struggling with mental health and substance use and intellectual disabilities and, and physical and mental disabilities um, and families of color and, you um, so that's really the, the reason that I'm here. I want to really work on improving these laws in a way that will protect children, but also reduce some of those, the, the disparate impact that it's having on those underprivileged communities. Thanks, Leanna, for being here. Also, you perked my Arkansas ears up, go Razorbacks. Uh, I'm from right outside Little Rock. So I liked hearing the, the Arkansas piece. Um, all right, moving on to Lori Jenkins. Hi, I'm Lori Jenkins, Executive Director and Co-Founder of Kindred Kids Child Advocacy Center. And I was elected by our child advocacy centers throughout Colorado and the Colorado Children's Alliance to be on here to represent um, child advocacy centers throughout Colorado. We, um, a lot of us do a lot of mandatory reporter training. And so I think it's important for us to have a voice in kind of what, does, what do we need to be doing differently? How does that look? Um, we see kiddos in our office every day, um, and a lot of our parents and caregivers have questions about their responsibilities for reporting, and it can get a little bit difficult to explain what that means to them. So I'm here representing um, Southern Colorado and my CAC, but as well as all of the other Colorado Child Advocacy Center. Appreciate it from Southern Colorado. Thanks, Lori. Um, all right, moving on to Margaret. Thanks, Trace, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Margaret Ochoa. I am the Child Sexual Abuse Prevention Specialist uh, for the School Safety Resource Center in the Department of Public Safety. And um, so that's the lens that I'm bringing. The, that's who I'm representing today. Um, and for the next couple of years, it sounds like, I'm excited to be here and to um, listen to all of you because it's like, balm for my soul to hear about the, the level of commitment and dedication that everyone has in all these different areas. I'm going to try not to be too repetitive. Um, the role that I play in the School Safety Resource Center, um, one of the big roles that I play is, is training, um, identification as well as um, uh, identification of child abuse, as well as uh, meeting statutory obligation to report. Uh, so the primary reason that um, this task force is, is so important to me is to protect children in the ways that you've all identified, to make sure that the system is working for them, um, working for their families, uh, working equitably. Um, additionally, I think it's, it's really important that we protect the process, um, that we communicate that process well because of, again, the reasons that you've art articulated about people uh, our mandated reporters' inability to determine when they need to be making those reports. Um, and I also feel a, a fierce um, 
loyalty to the teachers and other school staff that I uh, train. I wanna make sure that they feel safe with the knowledge that I present to them, which means that I need to step up my game and make sure that I can absorb all the wisdom of this group so that um, the school staff doesn't find themselves on the other side of the DA's office, as Jessica mentioned. Um, I also serve on the board of CICASA, the Colorado Coalition Against Sexual Assault, which has really opened my eyes to um, some, some problems that confidential advocates have with respect to uh, mandated reporting, knowing when they need to report, what they need to report, which leads me back into public safety because of the overlap of law enforcement and child welfare. I think that we need to clarify the roles there, clarify how we communicate where people need to report and how people need to report um, and help our um, law enforcement officers on the streets understand when and how to report domestic violence. So um, clarifying those paths is important to me and I appreciate the opportunity to serve with you all. Thanks, Trace. Thanks, Margaret. And you're, you're gonna make me make a comment that I've been thinking in my head, which is so many people on this call have soothing voices. There's so many like child focus. I was like, Margaret, I could just close my eyes right now and you just tell me a story. So, uh, so many of you have very like soothing child friendly voices. Just wanted to name that. So I look forward to the conversations. Uh, thanks, Margaret. All right, moving on. Uh, Maria Mendez. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, Maria Mendez, she, her pronouns. Um, I am the Strengthening Sexual Assault Services Project Director with CICASA, um, who Margaret just mentioned. Um, I've been with CICASA for four years now. Um, prior to that, I was at a private university doing direct service um, as the Sexual Assault Response Coordinator, um, before that, I was at a local domestic violence sexual assault program in California doing um, prevention work, working primarily with youth, um, anywhere between um, kindergartners to high school students um, and some college students as well. Um, so that's kind of where, where my lens is coming, my experience is coming from doing a lot of work with youth. Um, but currently with CICASA, um, doing a lot of work with advocates. Um, so my lens currently is with um, sexual assault advocates. Um, we call ourselves the advocates of advocates. So bringing forth that lens, um, we do a lot of training like a lot of you um, about when to report. Um, we, we do a lot of technical assistance so we do get a lot of advocates calling us as well of, hey, and uh, hypothetically in this situation, what I need to report. And so um, kind of similar to what a lot, a lot of you have been sharing, um, you know, some of that clarity is going to be very important for us as well on, on the advocate side. But I would like to also add similar to what Kathy, what Dr. Wells was talking about um, in, in a in a space where confidentiality is key and where trust is key for um, for getting support for, um, say, particularly teens who are seeking support for sexual violence, um, say, in a school or within their family or, you know, not even within their family, um, if they're building this trust, but then now we have to turn around and potentially break it. Um, there's just a lot of considerations that that have to go into that. And so just a lot of conversations, a, a lot of that lens that I want to be able to to bring from that perspective um, as advocates um, on our behalf. So I'm I'm excited to to be here um, and and bring that to the table um, at eight o'clock in the morning each of these times over the next couple of years. So thanks for having me all. Thanks, Maria. It's almost nine now, so we're all awake for sure. I can feel it. Uh, appreciate it. All right, Michael Nicoletti. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Nicoletti. I'm the Legislative Director at the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Um, so honestly, I'm here mostly to learn from all of you. Um, I do have some uh, equity, diversity background, um, but this is relatively new for me. I think I come uh, just to try to be the helpful regulator, see how we can uh, be of be of assistance in in 
and coordinating and disseminating information. I know that the um, the continuing competencies and education piece will come into this conversation as well. So um, I think just here to be a resource on that piece, but uh, again, uh, mostly looking forward to listening and learning a lot from all of you. Thanks, Michael, appreciate you being here. Um, all right, moving on, I think uh, Michelle Murphy, I saw you join. Uh, I know you had to join a little bit late, I think. So we're just introducing ourselves and, and uh, personally what brings us to this task force as well. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks. I have a member call every Wednesday morning. So getting here at eight will be tricky, but I will do my best. Um, I am the executive director of the Colorado Rural Schools Alliance. Um, we are obviously an advocacy organization. Our members are the rural school districts in the state. I'm also an attorney and by training a social worker. So I worked in the schools for a time. I serve as general counsel through a legal services program for um, a number of small rural school districts and have seen firsthand how the system works and doesn't work when we report either through the hotline and or to our community, through our law enforcement or DHS. Really our concerns are around resources and making sure that when we make a report, there's feedback and information in a timely manner and um, clarity around reporting obligations. And really most importantly, making sure that once a report is made, families and students get the supports that they need. Um, I will be like, I'm sure this has come up, but especially in our rural communities, we just don't have what we need to care for our kids, our neediest of kids. Uh, probably not a great way to say that, but I think you guys all know what I mean. Um, school districts have different statutes in place and clear policies in place about reporting. So we think we're differently postured with regard to any mandates in that regard. Um, I have walking orders from other school board attorneys as well. Um, as we get through this, we see that I see this as an opportunity to get some things right um, and maybe bring more attention and energy to the underlying issues as well. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Going to uh, flip it to the other Michelle on the task force, Michelle Dossie. Good morning. My name is Michelle Dossie, and I am the Child and Adult Protection Services Division Manager for Arapahoe County Human Services. Um, representing one of the 11 large uh, Department of Human Services agencies and the second busiest call-taking county in the state. Um, I have been with Arapahoe County Human Services for 28 years. Um, I spent 23 of those years working in child protection intake, um, including having roles uh, as a hotline caseworker, hotline supervisor, and an administrator over our hotline. I have spent uh, 24 of those 28 years doing the uh, mandatory reporter training, not only on how to identify and report child abuse and neglect, but also um, helping our community partners understand what happens after a referral is made in Arapahoe County and really representing what the work is being done, what work is being done across the state of Colorado in child welfare agencies. I also teach part-time for the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work, um, and I am a contracted trainer for the child welfare training system. I am super passionate about mandatory reporting. Um, after I finished my 23 years working in child protection intake, I implemented, um, I developed and implemented a program called Community Development and Prevention here in Arapahoe County, which was really founded on the premise that not all calls that come into child welfare agencies are as a result of abuse or neglect as the law defines it. Um, we get a lot of uh, reporting parties, primarily school districts, um, to which we have nine in Arapahoe County, that call because they're concerned for families, but they don't know how to engage with them and help them. And so that program's intention um, and what I spent three years developing was an opportunity to enhance the community partners um, capacity and ability and willingness to engage families um, to support them without making the Department of Human Services the default system to handle concerns specifically around poverty um, and other generalized social norms that they believe families should um, be adhering to. 
Um, so I'm super passionate about being on this task force. I'm really honored to have a seat at the table and I'm looking forward to leveraging my experience and not only um, the work in child welfare, but the training that I have provided and working with our community partners to make sure that they have what they need to support the family so that we don't have to be involved with families, especially um, disproportionately. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. We're honored to have you at the table. Um, I also want to name to folks, this is a heck of a roll call. I recognize that, but I love uh, that we're getting to hear who's all at the table. And we've got about 10 folks left, and then we're going to take a quick stretch hydration break. So we're in the home stretch. Just want to name that for folks. Um, all right, Monica, coming to you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Monica Rivera. I use she, her pronouns. I feel like right now I can just say, yeah, what they said. And, and close it out, right? Um, just really feeling super honored to be here with such a powerhouse of colleagues. Um, I currently serve as the executive director of Violence Free Colorado, which is the state's recognized domestic violence coalition. Um, similar to what Maria said from CICASA, we are, our job is to be the advocates of the advocates at the state level. Um, I come with, I've been working within the field of interpersonal violence prevention and confidential victim advocacy, advocacy in the state of Colorado for a little over 17 years. Most of that time was spent within higher education. So I am new to the state coalition and to the nonprofit realm. Um, yeah, and so I think, um, you know, sort of what has already been stated, but we know that mandatory reporting creates a barrier for survivors in their ability to access um, resources, particularly around domestic violence. And given lethality rates of domestic violence, we need to really make sure that our advocates are uh, a, um, an open resource for survivors. Um, and so I'm here to, you know, make sure that we are representing what um, advocates need on the ground. Thanks so much. Thanks, Monica. And I love it. Powerhouse, indeed. That's what I was just thinking. So I appreciate it. Speaking of powerhouse, another familiar face. Going to hand it over to Nate Helpern. Hey, uh, my name's Nate. Uh, I live currently in Georgetown, Colorado, up in the mountains, but uh, I'm from the city and I, I lived in the city for most of my life. Uh, I was in foster care when I was young. I was taken from my parents. My parents' rights were terminated. I kind of went through the juvenile system, uh, went to prison, got out, uh, started a family of my own, and uh, I had my own DNA case, and my kids were removed from me, one, uh, one of them twice. Um, and now currently I work with ORPC as a parent advocate, and I work with parents helping uh, helping them find their, find their path to getting their kids back uh, as somebody with lived experience. And um, so I really echo what everybody else has really already said. Um, obviously, uh, ma mandatory reporting has affected a lot of people, a lot of my friends and family. And and I don't even I was too, I'm too young to remember. I don't know if it could. It, it definitely could have been something that uh, affected me when I was younger. So I'm definitely uh, excited to be a part of all of these conversations and uh, the change that it'll lead in the nation. Thanks, Nate. Always great to see you and have you at the table. Uh, moving on to Nikki Surad. Yes, you said it correctly. All right. Uh, so my name is Nikki Surad. I am a supervisor in Mesa County. Um, I supervise a very unique team that, as far as I'm aware, no one in Colorado has a, a team like ours. Um, we call ourselves Specialized Assessment, and we are. It's a team of certified caseworkers. Um, who their main job role is to answer the hotline and take referrals, um, but they're also assessment workers. So they complete um, some specialized assessment, institutional assessments and um, the high severities, egregious, near fatal and fatal assessments. Um, they have specialized training. Uh, I was, I, I've supervised this team for almost five years and then I sat on the team for five years prior to that. I've been in child welfare here in Mesa County um, for almost 15. Um, I am super passionate about child welfare and child safety, and I'm excited to be here to be a part of something larger than myself and my county, um, creating change. I believe in mandatory reporting, and I think it holds an important role in our society and children's safety, and also can, can accept and understand and, and um, realize that there it does create a lot of disparities and it does create a lot of 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 concern um and so wanting to be a part of how do we balance the needs of of 
both. Um, because I've heard a lot of messages of, of let's get rid of mandatory reporting. And I certainly don't think that's the answer and want to be a part of making sure that it's the best system that we can possibly create. Um, I'm super passionate about having certified caseworkers answer the hotline. Here in Mesa County, we, we feel that it, it benefits the families better. Um, because we have, you know, trained caseworkers, we call them mini assessments, we, you know, we're doing an assessment on that hotline call, um, and determining what the best resource for that family is. And sometimes it's child welfare. And sometimes it's not. Um, so we make a lot of prevention referrals from our hotline calls. And including, you know, a prevent our, an in house prevention team, as well as external prevention. Um, and so really, you know, delving into getting a really good balanced assessment on that hotline call to make sure that that family is served um, the right way, um, right from the beginning. So very humbled to be here um, with all of the people and all of the experience that's in this room. Um, and I'm excited to learn from everyone and be a big part of this. Thanks, Nikki. Appreciate you being here. Um, Samantha Carwin. Sorry, I like just got in from walking the dog. <laughs> so you, you need a minute. The next person and give me like a minute. <laughs> yeah, you take you take a breather. We'll come back to you. <laughs> All right, Sarah Peel Sticker. Did I say right? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Um, I'm Sarah Peel Sticker. She her pronouns. I'm a staff attorney at Disability Law Colorado. Um, I'm based in Denver, but we our organization works statewide. Um, I've primarily spent my time at DLC on our youth advocacy team, as well as our facilities team. So working with youth and families who are involved in a variety of systems, um, as well as both youth and adults in different facilities throughout the state, from residential facilities um, to the state hospital to the Department of Corrections. Um, you know, as the state's protection advocacy organization, our um, goal is to protect and promote the rights of people with disabilities in the state of Colorado. And so I'm hoping to do exactly that in this space. So thank you for um, having me. I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Sarah. Appreciate you being here. Um, Shana Coran. Hi, I'm Shana Coran. I live out on the Western Slope in Rifle too. Um, I come with a lived experience of having involvement with the DHS system and the dependency and neglect. Um, I currently work at the Office of Parent Respondent Council as a parent advocate and at the ADC as a resource advocate. So I'm just here to bring the lived perspective of people that have been involved in the child welfare, child welfare system so their voices can be heard. Appreciate you being here, Shana. And Sam, looks like you're ready for us. So I'm going to come back to you. I'm so I kind of come with two hats from a professional hat. I'll say first that um, I'm from Nebraska. I've only been in Colorado for two years. And Nebraska is a more unique state where every adult is a mandatory reporter, which I'm not saying that's good or bad, but it's definitely a different perspective um, that I bring. And so I worked in Nebraska, did CPS work for about seven years, and then transitioned into doing more. Uh, mental health case management, actually worked in a really cool diversion program for CPS, did some domestic violence work for about five years. And as a special ed teacher, um, my most recent job here in Colorado has been as a family's minister. So thinking about what are we putting in our policies and procedures for those who work with our youth and our kids on how they go about reporting. Um, with my personal hat on, I was a foster kid. I'm in a sibling strip of eight. Um, I was adopted via kinship and my parents struggled with addiction and that led to my initial call and um, different ways led to all of my siblings also being placed into foster care and, and later adopted. I was a foster parent in Nebraska. I did a lot of work on supporting LGBTQ kids and foster care and working with ICWA. And then more recently, I dealt with a couple false allegations while I was going through a divorce. And so for me, I really want to think about how we're recognizing that those who are reported on tend to be black and brown and have under-resourced communities and all of those disproportionate things, but also how are we addressing it and once those kids are removed and getting them the support that they need. Um, in understanding what's what's happened and dealing with false allegations, which is unfortunately really common during divorce situations. So that's kind of what I'm bringing to the table. I love what you're kind of bringing to the table, Sam. Thanks for being here. Uh, what kind of what what kind of dog did you just walk, by the way? 
You can't just uh, say you walk the dog and then not show yeah, us. Yeah, she's a she's a mutt, so we think she's part uh rid, Rahitan, Ridgeback and Boxer. So she's a big beast. <laughs> That's a good one. I love it. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Um, Stephanie, I know that you got to talk a little bit, but we're gonna bring you in as a as the as the chair of this and and get to talk individually. Uh, obviously, we know who you are, but uh, why are you excited about this this task force on the personal side? Yeah, um, thanks, Trace, and and yes, I I have uh, really had my entire legal and public policy career here in Colorado, going on about three decades now. Um, you know, I I left law school, and I was always wanting to be engaged in public and. Um, well, child protection issues. And I've been really fortunate that I've been able to do that in our state. Um, I think Colorado is one of the best places for us to make changes. Uh, when you ask me, Trace, um, I think that what I've really learned is we're the biggest small or we're the smallest big town is what I always like to say, right? We're a big state. We have a lot of things going on and yet we're small enough that we can convene rich conversations and I think make great progress on, on issues. And I have seen it in the history of my career for three decades. And so by way of saying, I, I love this process, I love this format, and I think Coloradans just have a way uh, to come together still, right? And, and make changes um, and really access those people on the ground uh, who know. Right, whether you've lived the experience as a professional or personally. So um, by way of saying that's why I love this process and I'm glad to be part of it. Thanks, Stephanie. I love the phrase Coloradans just have a way. That's a good one. I feel like we need to submit that to the governor's office for like a, yeah, I just a want subject. branding rights on it so I can retire, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. Trademark that quickly. I love it. Um, all right, Tara Doc Doxter. Did I say that right? Tara, you out there? She's Tara's not going to be here to tell me if I didn't get it right. Hi. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, my name is Tara Doxeter, and I am a parent advocate with the ORPC. I um, am also a recovery coach with um, like a nationally certified recovery coach where they are mandated reporters. And so I have a role where I'm not a mandated reporter as a parent advocate and as a parent or as a peer coach, a mandated reporter. I um, have had some lived experience and, and I'm really here just trying to see what supports we can, what resources and supports we can put in place to help mandated reporters maybe be more supporting rather than reporting. Um, and that's kind of my role and where I'm at in this task force. Love it. Thanks, Tara, for being here. Appreciate it. Um, Tess McShane. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Tess McShane. I'm the fatherhood manager with Family Resource Center Association. And so um, our organization, FRCA, helps to support 31 family resource centers with their collaborative case management and resource and referral through capacity building, training, programming, um, and membership support. And then in my role, I help to um, coordinate what's called the Colorado Fatherhood Network, which is a statewide systems level network for practitioners and programs and organizations who want to support um, father engagement and services as like kind of a strategy in prevention. And so I'm here um, before this role, I worked in the behavioral health field with um, children and families. And so I was mandated reporter there. And then um, really here to um, help explore kind of um, what everyone has already said and also the underlying issues that kind of lead to reporting and looking at reducing um, ambiguity and increasing clarity around reporting that I think allows um, bias that disproportionately affects marginalized communities. And also looking, I think someone said it really well around how we can look at reporting uh, first before reporting as some um, things can really be mitigated with kind of resources and services. So that is what I bring. Thank you. Thanks, Tess. Appreciate you being here. Um, all right, three more folks. Yolanda Arredondo. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Yolanda Arredondo. I knew I'd either be close to being first or last <laughs> based on Y and A in my name. Um, so I wasn't sure which way we're going to start. So I currently serve as the deputy director of the state's division of child welfare, and I'm on this 
task force representing the Colorado Department of Human Services and glad to be on the task force with all of you. It's been great to hear all the different agencies and perspectives that you all represent. I um, definitely would echo a lot of what's already been said. I would also just add from my personal professional perspective that I've served as a caseworker um, at a Metro County here in the Denver area. I've also served as a hotline worker, so been a certified caseworker taking calls on the hotline like the supervisor from Mesa County mentioned, been a hotline supervisor, child welfare casework supervisor, admin, and now deputy director. So just a lot of different perspectives, I think from my 15 years of experience in child welfare. And in particular, I think that cross-section of experience also having done a lot of mandatory reporter trainings throughout the state, just trying to bring the types of questions and issues and um, perspectives that those trainings have given me insight to, to also try to represent some of those questions in the areas that people have mentioned where there's a lack of clarity, where there's just very diverse perspectives on whether there even should be a mandatory reporter law or not, um, and really making sure that at least um, again, from my cross-section of professional experience, I can try to do my best to maybe answer some questions, share that, that opinion and perspective, and then definitely have an open mind to hearing all of yours. So really um, look forward to this work that we'll have together on the task force. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate you being here. Um, Zane Grant. Good morning. Uh, I'm, I'm Zane Grant. I am the executive director of three CASA programs, court appointed special advocates here in Southern Colorado. I oversee CASA of Pueblo, Heart of Colorado CASA, and Arkansas Valley CASA. Um, I started, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I started my career in child welfare in 1997 as a caseworker. And um, I'm in my 21st year now as the director of a CASA program. Um, about 15 years ago, I, I developed a mandatory reporter training here in our community. Uh, kind of born out of a lot of frustration um, from from both mandatory reporters and I think even our, our department officials that just there was just a pretty big gap in communication. And so I've been doing this training and kind of gathering feedback from mandatory reporters from various areas from um, education to, um, you know, physicians, just many different areas. Um, I've done this training and just kind of listen to some of the feedback about some of the frustrations mandatory reporters have when they call in, um, how to, I think really how to give some quality to maybe their reporting and kind of speaking the same language that uh, the Department of Human Services speaks to try to, you know, convey their concerns about the welfare of a child. And then I've also been on the other side, um, obviously working in child welfare where, where we work very closely with families that are involved in the child welfare system. And so um, I too was elected to this position by our 18 CASA programs here in the state of Colorado to serve as the CASA representative as well. So kind of a couple different um, hats I'm wearing here, but super excited to delve in and, and I think kind of get some of our questions talked through and and some of the ambiguity that everyone's already talked about, I think would be super helpful. So I'm really excited to be here with all of you and, and thanks for welcoming me. Great, thanks Zane, appreciate you being here. And typically you would be last, but Jill Cohen, I bumped Jill down. So Jill, bring us home, you're the last one. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jill Cohen. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm also a parent of two kids. Um, I am currently the director of programs for the Office of Respondent Parents Council. Um, we represent all of the parents who have dependency and neglect cases and who um, qualify for um, in court appointing counsel. Um, I oversee our interdisciplinary programming, so we assign social workers as well as parent advocates to work alongside parents and their lawyers um, in the state of Colorado. That's been growing. And I'm so proud and happy to have my colleague Shana and Nate and Tara on here with us so that we can really bring um, and amplify the voices of parents to this, to this program. Um, I also teach some classes at DU School of Social Work on uh, legal and policy issues. This comes up a lot. And you know, my lens is similar to some other advocacy lenses, which is when an advocate is listed as a mandated reporter and what, uh, what role we play to support families and children um, when we're trying really hard <laughs> to operate as confidential advocates um, and really build trust in that way. And I just want to say, you know, to close it out that I think that it's a very undervalued way to show love and support for children. 
is to show love and care for their parents. And I think that we have a lot of opportunity to show love and care for parents um, when we have resources, time um, to stay with them and help them through an issue. And you know, over the past 20 years, being an advocate for parents in both New York City and in Colorado, I have had the opportunity to really serve parents and families by sticking around with them and really showing them that support um, and not always having to rely on um, on calling a hotline and passing the buck. So I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to meet all of you and look forward to our work. Thanks, Jill. Appreciate you being here. Did I forget anyone that's on the task force or not forget you, but did I skip over anybody that's on the task force? Okay. Well, with that, Jill, with the soothing voice, again, I stand by my assertion that every, so many people on here have such nice voices. We're going to take a break uh, and think about this powerhouse of a team that you all are on. Uh, super excited and honored to be here and support this work. We're going to come back at 930, which means cameras are back on and we're talking right at 930. So we'll see you then. All right. Going to bring folks back. The timeliness, I'm loving it. Give it just a little longer. And then Doris, I'm gonna hand it over to you and I've got the, the Jamboard link uh, ready, to, ready to roll when you are. All right, fantastic. So we are going to have um, uh, yet another opportunity for, uh, for folks to all engage um, on a prompt question. We're actually gonna do it a little bit different than the round, round robin. Um, and we'll bring up uh, a Jamboard. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Jamboard, it's a whiteboarding, a, a technical whiteboarding feature uh, that will allow us um, all to, and by us, I mean all of you, uh, to uh, actively engage with um, and, and provide some content. Um, so what we want to do is uh, get a sense from you. Um, it was fantastic hearing about your backgrounds and um, lots of lawyers in the house, whoop, whoop. Um, and uh, what brought you to uh, this task force. Um, also want to get a sense of um, your worries, knowing that um, lots of folks have, um, you know, opinions about perspectives on um, child welfare writ large, um, and some knowledge and experience in uh, mandatory reporting specifically, uh, but wanting to get a sense of your biggest worries and your biggest hopes. So we'll start with um, the, the question, and again, we'll pull up the Jamboard um, in just a second. What is your biggest concern about the current mandatory reporting system in Colorado? Uh, some of you uh, provided a little bit of that in, in your intro um, based on your personal and professional experiences uh, and the organizations that you uh, represent. Um, so I think we have a, in the chat, you will see um, a link to the Jamboard. Um, and I will walk you through in um, in just a moment. It looks like some of you have already um, gone in there. Um, so on the for those of you not familiar, on the left hand side, there are um, icons. Um, we want you to use, thank you, the sticky note feature. Um, once you click on that, you can you can just type in uh, your response. Um, we'll 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 give you about um, you know, five minutes or so to, to and then we'll, we'll do a check-in to see how active the whiteboard is. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the themes and, and uh, provide a, a quick opportunity for folks to uh, reflect back out verbally in the room, um, any um, additional commentary. Um, and then we'll move on to the second prompt question. Any questions? Right, fantastic. The Doris, the only thing I would remind folks is that this this activity is for um, task force members only, um, and so we're asking that um, that folks in this Jamboard are, are folks that are members of the task force. Awesome, thank you for that, Trace. And I'm sorry, this is Colleen. For some reason, it's telling me there's currently too many people viewing the Jamboard. And please try again later. Is there a, is there usually a, and I use Jamboard quite a bit. There's usually yeah. not too many people in a Jamboard. 
I know I've never run into that. I I have, but usually it's at like a hundred people and there's not a hundred people here. So let me try a different browser. Let me just see if it's a browser issue. Is anybody else seeing that? Let me try okay. a different browser. It's probably my browser. Okay, thank okay. you, Colleen. Colleen, you must be on a PC. I'm gonna I'm gonna cross my fingers. <laughs> I am right on now. a PC and I am on um my CDE. I'm gonna go to my personal Google and out of my CDE Google because it loves to do that. Okay. All right, cool. And that is true. Okay, I'm in on my. Oh no, you're in. Oh, fantastic. I'm in on my personal. It's just gonna look a little funky. Thank you. Thank you. Can you throw that link in the chat one more time? Never mind, I got it. Yeah, Sam, I just saw you, so I put it in. <laughs> yeah, I just saw. Thanks. Uh huh. Give you maybe another minute or so. I'm not seeing any new. I'm just trying to make sure that uh, we remove any overlap. I saw I saw the screen go white for a minute and got really worried. <laughs> yeah, you too. I was like, what just happened? <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I'm so glad it came back. I almost panicked. All right, so doing a little bit of cleanup.
All right, feel free to continue adding. Um, I'm gonna share out uh, some of the themes here. I continue to try to uh, surface some of the ones that were um, are overlapping. So we have folks um, naming uh, both in uh, the introductions as well as here, uh, concerns around disproportionality and implicit bias impacting uh, decision-making. Uh, we have um, folks indicating um, the need for uh, you know, greater clarity um, around what to report when and how, um, you know, wanting to uh, really lean in on what it looks like to support families and talk to them and understand their underlying needs um, in addition to and or separate from uh, reporting. Um, the complicated role that one takes on as a reporter uh, when you also work in a role um, and or uh, want to, uh, to help families, um, you know, wanting to have uh, clear guidance and understanding on um, what gets reported. Um, again, Nate, I'm, I'm trying to uh, track some of these. Um, child welfare not seen as a helper, uh, but as a surveil surveiller. Um, again, that that leads to uh, uh, sometimes disproportionality and, all, and also sometimes families not, um, you know, maybe getting some of their underlying needs uh, met. Uh, before and or outside of the child welfare system. Uh, concerns about uh, rural communities and uh, the more limited resources that, um, that often exist in rural environments, um, as well as one of the additional um, uh, challenges, barriers in rural communities being one where when you're in a small community, um, it's harder to be um, anonymous and so um, wanting to protect anonymity and confidentiality in, 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 in small communities uh, becomes hard. Looks like we still have some more coming in. Oh, I love it. We will um, download all of these uh, comments so we and, and, and group them up uh, by themes and, and share that back out with this group as well. Doris, do you mind if I jump I'm trying in? To see if there, oh, absolutely. I'm trying to see if there's some other themes here too. Well, I was I was just going to ask, I was going to throw it to the group and see, you know, I, I heard you sharing the themes just now, but also wondering if anybody wrote something on here that they didn't hear addressed in the themes that they feel like, uh, you know, based on your, your experience and expertise that you feel like this is a really big theme for us, you know, just, just kind of curious if anybody's out there thinking something specific. I'm seeing Sam. Something I feel like I heard in the intros and I've seen in my experience is people don't talk to families. So they make a report and don't take the time to actually talk directly to the family or to the child. Yeah, thank you for that, that Sam. Um, also wanted to, to name the um, this poverty too often viewed as neglect. So conflating poverty with neglect um, is, is an issue that we see um, across the country. Uh, that obviously has significant imp impacts and implications. I think related to that is, um, and we see this theme um, in some of the, the sticky notes as well, um, around you know, trying to provide services and support or intervene in a way that gets families access to services and supports that they need, even if the underlying issue may not be um, abuse or uh, neglectful parenting that is intentional. Uh, there's a uh, lack of follow-up feedback um, to the mandatory mandatory reporters um, and sort of this this uh, black hole, um, if you will, of information when reports get made. Uh, we also heard this in in the introduction. So wanting to um, you know think about uh, as part of this group uh, what that feedback loop looks like once reports are made by mandatory reporters. I'm seeing Jill with her hand up, Jill. I think we absolutely underestimate how scary it is to get investigated and we act like that's normal that at any moment you could get a knock on the door and it creates such fear and I think you know I can't only speak for myself but 
I would call a lawyer if I got a knock on the door. And I think we just undervalue how important it is that parents feel that trauma and sadness and fear, and it affects their children when they're investigated. Awesome. Thank you for, for naming that, that um, Jill. One of the things in sort of thinking about the, the curricula that we will have over the course of our two years of time together, we will be absolutely best friends. Um, this whole group uh, will be like a community of friends um, at the end of this. But, um, you know, one of the things that, that I think is important uh, to think about is the harm done once, that do once, once your, nor your door is knocked on. Um, that it's not an action that is without harm, even if um, the uh, report is unfounded. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, along the way um, because we wanna make sure that there's an understanding of, um, again, all of those perspectives and also the, the, the consequences of action as well as inaction. So thank you for naming that. And that applies to programs as well, right? When for we sure. Have comes in with great authority and starts saying we're going to post announcements on the door and you have to notify parents and all of these different things before there's ever a finding. Um, it has an impact on, on every professional in that setting. Awesome. Thank you for naming that, Dawn. Any other uh, points of note regarding um, you know, concerns that you have as we, um, as we be begin to enter these conversations. I'm trying to scan my Hollywood squares here to see if anyone has their hand raised or comes off mute. Yeah. Not seeing anybody right now. Awesome, thank you. So again, we will, uh, we will collate these into themes and we will share that back out. Uh, with all of you following the task force meeting. All right, so we have another prompt question um, that I actually want to do not as uh, a Jamboard. I wanna go back to um, hearing all of your uh, wonderful soothing voices. Um, and it's sort of a, a, a related question, but, but flips the, the script in terms of um, helping us to establish what is the vision for the best outcome um, of this work. Uh, and see, uh, uh, Trace, can you put the, um, put this, the second prompt um, in the chat? Um, so we want to get a sense from you, uh, what's the biggest thing um, you'll point to and look back on and say, we made that transformation. Um, so, you know, again, trying to get at um, what is the, the biggest hope that you have uh, for this work, uh, and uh, no more than two things um, that um, that we want you to name. So uh, your your biggest hope for this work, if we get this right, what does it look like? Um, uh, and if you could just name uh, no more than two items. And we are going. I'm actually going going to do um, another roll call on that. Um, and we're going to try to do this, uh, you know, fairly quickly. Uh, but I'm going to start from the reverse order that that Trace went in, um, and starting with you, Jill Cohen. I I don't think I'm ready to answer it. Okay, fantastic. We'll come back to you, uh, Zane Grant. Well, I think it's it's kind of what we've already talked about. For me, I I want to see that um, you know this is. Uh, productive use of our time and that what what the finished product is just going to be this amazing um, update to our statute that that will uh, encompass everyone's you know concerns as far as uh, you, you know getting through those and our final product will just be able to really uh, shine shine a, a spotlight for the nation on how we do child welfare here in, in Colorado with some of the exciting changes that need to be made to our very outdated statute. Awesome thank you Zane. Uh, Yolanda Arredondo. So in reading the question, the word that um, echoes in my mind is just the word clarity, right? So that, and whatever that, that may mean different things to different people, it's just the word that um, first came to my mind in reading the question, that if we do this right, that there will be clarity moving forward for um, folks who are identified as mandatory reporters and clarity for other, like for families, for agencies, for child welfare workers, all of the above. 
Awesome. Thank you. I love, I love it when, when you have like sort of a thematic word, like this is the word that, word that you're honing in on. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Tess McShane. Hi. Yeah, I think similarly, I think the piece that keeps sticking out to me is both around clarity and support for those who are reporters. So I think having clarity around the statute so that there is less ambiguity that I think has negative consequences, but also I think an increase of support for those who are reporters around other strategies or mitigations to those things that they may have considered reporting on. I think that would be a very um, innovative practice to have throughout the state. Awesome, thank you. Stephanie. I lost your box. There we go. I have it. I would say that my greatest hope is that we really spark change, right? That um, people don't look at our work and go, yeah, there's these really broad 30,000 foot recommendations or thoughts that nobody knows what to do with, right? Um, I hope that we are able as a group to spark real um, change in the form of bringing to Colorado, right, uh, innovation um, in this space, uh, looking at other uh, states to find out what they're doing, what we might do, how we might build on those efforts. So um, I think that's my greatest hope. And along with that, I would say right-sizing child welfare. <clears throat> I think that when I look at mandated reporting, it is the front door to everything, right? We can say there's too many kids in foster care, and try to fix that. But if you don't fix mandated reporting, that doesn't matter. You can say we have an open re representation of parents. If you don't address the front door, you can't address that either, right? So to me, it's really about looking at this front door and trying to figure out how do we right size child protection for what it was always initially envisioned to be, as opposed to sort of this entire umbrella that we're saying you must not only do protection, but also prevention and the inherent conflicts and all that. Awesome. Thank you for naming that, that Stephanie. Um, you know, it, when we look at um, data uh, across the country, particularly around uh, disproportionality and disparities, uh, the place at which uh, disparities are introduced into systems um, most of the time is at the point of referral. Um, and in many of those instances, the driving um, population is or report source is uh, mandatory reporters, uh, many of them being professional reporters. So I appreciate you naming that. All right, Shana. For me, my biggest hope is to make sure that we are seeing parents and supporting them and supporting the whole multi multi multidisciplinary team, if I can get that word out correctly today. Um, just like everyone else is saying, I think there's a lot of unclear questions of like what expectations are. And I just am really looking at how we can support everyone as a whole and make sure those clarities are clear for everybody. Awesome. Thank you. And I think that, you know, thank you for again, naming, um, you know, this is um, the second time here in, in this particular round about thinking about um, parents um, and, and uh, the impact of, of parents and really wanting to support them. All right. Thank you, Sarah. I think the word coming to mind for me is empowerment. So empowering families, empowering individuals, uh, empowering each other, um, empowering the state of Colorado towards system change. Awesome, I love that. What a, what a powerful word. All right, Sam. I think the number one for me is just the disproportionate for black and brown people. So that number being reduced, not only from the reporting, but what we're calling substantiated. <laughs> so looking at that, and I think the training, I've seen some really good DEI training that occurs for mandatory reporters, for people doing that initial assessment, um, getting them to learn their own bias and not just in a five second thing, but doing the real work. So they're not bringing that into their work ongoing. Awesome, thank you. So again, naming, um, reducing disproportionality, um, I, and at those two decision points, right, like the um, at the point of referral uh, or when a report is made, as well as um, in the findings of, of that that report. Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. I think um, there's probably lots of things, but I, I would love to see um, a really consistent training that incorporates not only, you know, reporting and things like that, but what 
other things that you can do. I think someone named it of, you know, they're just reporting and they're not doing anything else. Um, so not having that be the, the end all and be all. And so that training on implicit bias and what else can you do and to how to tap into resources and how to support this person before you ever have to make a report and having that pretty consistent across the state. Awesome. Thank you. I think, I think you name a really important point and we saw this in the jam board as well around, um, you know, sometimes when folks report, it's because they don't know what else they could do. Um, yes, you could potentially engage with a family. I'd say maybe, um, you know, it depends on the nature of the relationship that you have, the skill that you have and sort of navigating that difficult conversation. Um, and so having mechanisms and um, uh, resources available so that, so that, it, that so it's not the end all be all, right? Like it's not the only um, thing that people can think of uh, to do. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Nathaniel. Uh, Nate, right? You're talking about me? Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. When I said it, I was like, I think he goes by Nate. Yeah, no, it's um, okay. And yeah. then I didn't see your box right away. Yeah, but um, two things. I think uh, the first thing I want to say is I think being the, uh, the first state to re really look at it, out of everybody in the country, I think it's a privileged position to be in because we're going to, it kind of sets the standard of how it happens. And I think I heard you guys say earlier that Colorado was the first state to have mandated reporting. So I think it's really, really important that everybody takes their time, uh, takes their time and really invest the time uh, to really narrow down on all of this, on everything that it entails. And the second thing I feel like is really important is because it affects so many people and so many people are mandated reporters or fall under that umbrella. Um, I think it's important that when we're having conversations about about it, that we're really keeping the interest of the families and the kids in mind and not the interest of how it's going to impact the, everybody here. Because it's going to definitely, you know, there might some of some of the things that might come from this involves changes that drastically impacts some of some some people's on this call's livelihood. Maybe that's I don't, I don't, that's how you, your job is to be a mandated reporter or it's going to affect something like that. So I think it's really important that uh, everybody's able to separate what's in the interest of themselves and what's in the interest of the kids and families in the community. Awesome. Thank you so much for naming that, Nate. Um, at the end of the day, this really is about keeping kids safe and supporting families, ensuring that they have um, the, the resources and uh, uh, that they need to be able to safely care for their children. Um, and so making sure that that um, is a cornerstone of this work um, is critically important. So I really appreciate you naming that, Nate. All right, Monica. Um, yeah, I think a lot of, I appreciate Nate's comment. Um, it's kind of where my mind was going to. And I think that sometimes, um, you know, communities will uh, kind of demand or request change and then task forces are often the place where action can go to die. Um, and so when I think about like looking back on our time here, I hope that we're able to continue to center the communities most impacted and that, um, you know, that this isn't, it's not an experience where we, you know, we hear, oh, there XYZ is a problem, then a task force is convened. I know I'm getting paid to be here. Uh, we talk about, yes, XYZ is a problem. We create a report affirming XYZ is a problem, which is exactly what the community had already said. And then that's the end. And so, um, you know, so I think balancing that and also realizing that a task force can't, you know, make changes, but there is tremendous power here. I also think about folks who may um, not necessarily know some of the damaging aspects of mandatory reporting, who will listen to a task force, who will read the report. And so taking that potential to educate seriously. So yeah, I guess just maybe um, looking back, I appreciate the question, what looking back, what would feel like that, you know, we had actually made transformation. I think it is remaining centered on who we are attempting to support and serve and that we don't, um, you know, waste time. Awesome, thank you. So with this, when we were going through the introductions um, and uh, it, it was clear to me, not only that we have the right people at the table from a um, you know, professional and personal experience perspective, uh, but also from the, you know, what folks vocalize as their why for being on this task force. So I don't think it would be possible for this group, and this is just me coming in, not knowing any one of you, 
um, to uh, leave this leave this work two years from from now and not have um, accomplished um, a great deal. Uh, but I do appreciate you naming that. You know, really wanting to you to to take this charge seriously, um, and uh, you know, make the commitment to um, actually advancing some meaningful work. All right, Michelle. Oh, sorry, Michelle Murphy. Um, interesting, interesting, oh, sorry. Interesting comments so far all over the spectrum. I think what I, I think clarity certainly and um, alignment with sort of some of these stated purposes and then what we're actually <laughs> telling folks to do on the ground um, without any ambiguity and I think some mandatory providers are in a great position to provide supports and others like our educators are, that's not their primary job. So we really need to be clear about what the expect, if there are different expectations, which could be a can of worms, but let's be clear what we're asking folks to do and what their skill set is um, in all regards. Keeping of course, it's also not only just families sometimes impacted by this often, our claims of abuse are as to employees and even other students. And how do we mitigate and respond and manage all of those in the system? Awesome, thank you. Uh, so, you know, really naming that that we have to be attentive to um, what comes out and ensuring that it, um, you know, can be applied to the, the various populations that we're thinking about, um, you know, the various folks who would be impacted uh, by recommendations from this group. Well, I think the set, yeah, I think the different uh, representatives on this task force have just based on this conversation, different ideas of the purpose and the import of sure. mandatory reporting. Um, and I think that's really important to unpack. Absolutely, yep, absolutely. And important to have, right? Like, so important to have, yeah. like to make sure that we have all those, those perspectives represented so that we don't miss absolutely. anything. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Michelle Dossi. You know, I know that the, you know, the premise of this group is to really work on the legislation around um, who is required to report and the clarity around that reporting, but I don't believe that we can achieve that until we actually change uh, what is in statute around what abuse and neglect is as defined by law. I think neglect is obviously the most commonly reported most often type of child maltreatment rec uh, reported. And that is where there is lack of clarity, not only for our community, but also for our child welfare agencies, which is why you see differences in how counties choose to um, assign or respond to those concerns. So if I were in charge of the world, I would love to see um, the legislation change for the definitions of abuse and neglect in the state. Awesome. Thank you for naming naming um, that complexity, Michelle. Um, so that you know, as we uh, move forward, we will have to think about um, not only you know the 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 particular statute around uh, mandatory reporting, uh, but the extent to which that statute is impacted by and or impacts other statutory requirements um, in the state um, as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Michael. Hey there, and sorry about the lack of camera. I am not well today, so I'm in and out of like the bedroom, so it's not the best view. Um, we appreciate you joining despite not feeling well. Hope you uh, recover quickly. Of course, no problem. Um, you know, I, mean, I think it goes without saying that um, the agency perspectives are gonna be unique. Um, and so for me, um, especially I think being Dora, um, selfishly will be to stay in my lane when I need to, um, but also look for creative ways to kind of translate all of the knowledge and, and ideas that you all have um, and try to be a resource and try to um, figure out ways to, to get things to fit into state government. Sometimes uh, the state government isn't the most nimble um, and logical creature out there. And so, um, I try whenever I'm in a part of these types of discussions to just be as creative as I can. So hopefully in two years, I can look back and say, oh, I helped us navigate some, some difficult, maybe regulatory structures or, you know, hey, for our 40 different boards and the fact that they're all independent um, 
or you know stuff like that. So uh, again, I'm at very much at the beginning of this learning phase, listening phase. But um, hopefully, as the agency representative for Dora um, can help to break down some of those sort of annoying uh, governmental barriers to sort of free flowing ideas, as I'm hoping and I'm, I'm sure they will be coming throughout this process. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. What do you mean state government isn't always nimble or creative? <laughs> I say that having been uh, a state employee for 10 years. <laughs> no, I get it. Uh, appreciate um, uh, having you here. And, and you know, so one of the things that, that I was thinking about as you were speaking, Michael, is, is um, you know, at the end of the day, we want this to be uh, to result in some, you know, actionable um, practical, like implementable, um, uh, change. And so, you know, having, uh, the opportunity to really think about like, what are the on the ground imp implications of any recommendations that come from this group, I think is really important. And included in that is, you know, any, uh, regulatory changes or, um, trying to think about how this gets, um, implemented on the ground, I think is really important. Absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Maria. Yeah, um, kind of what everybody's been saying, right? Um, the clarity is a big thing. Um, the two words that come to mind for me, though, are trust and confidence, both from the side of survivors, right? Again, with the advocate lens for sexual violence. Um, so both for survivors and also for advocates of trust um, trust that people are going to be able to come come to us as advocates and feel confident that we're going to be able to provide support, particularly for for minors, um, that we're not going to be um, sending them to a system that maybe is going to be causing more harm. <laughs> um, and for the advocates as well, having trust and confidence in what they need to do. So again, coming back with the 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 clarity, confidence in that process, confidence in um, you know, a lot of questions that I get often um when when people are seeking TA of like um this I I have a teenager that came to me, but they're my my own child's friend. Do I have to re report, right? So like clarity and confidence ar around their role and when their role <laughs> is a mandated reporting role. And so just a lot of trust and confidence um, in, in them and, and, you know, and confidence of what they have to do. So kind of similar to like that clarity piece um, so that we can provide the best support. I really like what a couple of people have said about support, not report. I'm, I'm like furiously writing that down. I really appreciate that. So thank you, Maria. Margaret. So ditto confidence, but um, confidence a little differently. Um, confidence in systems, confidence in you know, in building confidence in our trainers to know that what they're training is uh, consistent across the state, that it's reliable, that they can use it um, as a foundation for interpreting the many, many different fact patterns that arise every day. Um, confidence in um, mandated reporters um, knowing what their role is, when to report, how to report, to whom to report. Um, uh, confidence that um, in our families that um, they, they believe the systems are equitable and that people are treated fairly. Um, confidence in child welfare because the work that they do is phenomenal and they offer great resources and we need to communicate that so that um, people understand that child welfare isn't punitive. It's not designed to trick people. Um, and, and we need to, to make sure that it is working. Um, I guess also, confidence that um, law enforcement and child welfare will respond um, in a trauma-informed way um, to support mm. families. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, lots, lots of their, um, lots of what you said, I um, I think was was really meaningful and rich. I think the, the thing that I wanna 
um, uh, name is around trauma-informed care um, and ensuring that, that the responses um, really do take into um, account not only the previous trauma experiences uh, by that child and or family, uh, but also the impact of that intervention by uh, law enforcement and our child welfare uh, and the additional trauma that it causes and are approaching that um, from that mindset. Thank you for naming that, Margaret. Lori. Hi. Um, I, in the beginning, I kind of felt like I, I had the same thought as most of you. Um, I kind of felt like I don't at this point. Um, just a little bit different. Um, as a child advocacy center, we're brought in by law enforcement and the Department of Human Services to work on these cases that get reported. And um, but we're also advocates for our children and for our families. And I think we need clarity on how we can work as a multidisciplinary team and trust that each agency is going to do the right thing. Um, you know, responding in a trauma informed way. Um, we find, at least I do in my SDAC, that it becomes an issue or a barrier for our law enforcement when we have reports that are made, but we don't know who made the reports. And therefore, we can't go in and they can't go in and investigate them because there's no one to investigate them with because that information is not is not provided. Um, and although that is very good for the reporting party, and I understand we understand that piece it makes it difficult if that report is not detailed enough. And so what we end up doing is we, we end up leaving some children in homes that should not be in those homes because we just simply don't have enough information from the reporting party for law enforcement to take action. But there's no way for law enforcement to take action if we can't, if they can't interview that reporting party. So I would like to see some, you know, clarification on how multidisciplinary teams specifically working with child advocacy centers can work around that. Um, we do have MOUs with all of our law enforcement and our Department of Human Services. Um, and we work with our families and we try to explain that to them. But it's really hard to tell a family who has had multiple reports come in and they're trying to get something to happen. And our law enforcement has to say, I'm sorry, but we just don't have enough from the reports that are coming in to be able to take action. And then those children end up going back home. Um, and so that makes it difficult for my advocates to advocate and advocates across uh, the state and child advocacy centers. So that kind of came to mind. Um, and then I would agree with everyone else training. Um, we need to have a standardized training so that everyone's getting the same message. Um, in our area, we started doing that in one um, training by one agency so that we know that everyone's getting that same information. Um, but for child advocacy centers, I think just having some clarity on how we can work better with multidisciplinary teams so that we can facilitate better services, more appropriate services for our families and our children um, and ensure that they are safe. Awesome. Thank you for that, Lori. And what I what I love about the composition of, of this group, and I think what was really brilliant in the statute, um, is the inclusion of all of these various perspectives um, so that we can be thinking about um, the impacts to each and also the intersections between. Um, and so, you know, really trying to think about like how this ecosystem can function in a way um, where we are uh, acting in fact like partners um, in service of um, the best outcomes for the child and the family. So thank you for naming that, Marie. Leanne. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think one of my hopes more broadly for this task force is to kind of break down the binary that I see and I'm sure many of you see amongst child welfare professionals. I think, you know, what I mean by that is that I, there's this idea that if you're a professional in the child welfare system, that you're kind of either um, pro-child or pro-parent, and you either care about children and protecting their safety, or you care about protecting parents and their rights, and, and that you can't support both. There's this idea that, you know, parent advocates don't care about kids, children advocates don't care about parents, and that sort of thing, and we all kind of 
come to this with different perspectives. Um, and it's easy to kind of um, think that, you know, have this us versus them mentality. I think I just, I see that a lot when we're having these conversations about child protection concerns. Um, and I really think that Jill Cohen like hit the nail on the head when she said that the most undervalued way to support and show love to children is to support and show love to parents. And what I'm hearing from a lot of people here is that reporting is often or maybe even usually not the best way to do that. Um, and at the same time, I'm hearing that mandatory reporters are in a very difficult position where they have to report even when they know or think it's not the best thing to do and we need to come up with some alternatives for them and some solutions to that problem. So I would echo what others have said about, you know, coming up with with a resolution to that problem so that people can support rather than report when reporting is not the best solution. Um, you know, as, as an attorney, I often have to take an adversarial role. So I think that's part of where that us versus them mentality comes from. But on this task force, you know, I hope that we can all collaborate and hear one another's concerns and have an exchange of ideas from all these different perspectives you know, understanding that we all come from a place of caring deeply about the welfare of children. Um, and we come to this from different backgrounds and we all have valuable contributions to make. Um, you know, there are people on this task force who have lived experience as both children and parents in this system. And I, I think those things are all interconnected. Um, so I hope that for those of us who have internalized this idea that, you know, you're either on one side or the other that we can start to break that down um, and that you know we can build an understanding that that these perspectives are all interconnected and and the problems that we're addressing are systemic and they're cyclical you know people who are afflicted as as children are also later afflicted as parents often um, so I'm hoping to to kind of break down that un, us versus them dynamic in this child welfare professional space. Um, and I really hope that we can amplify the voices of children and families afflicted by this system. And I think that throughout this process, it's going to be really important that we all listen, especially to our task force members who have that lived experience. Awesome. Thank you, um, Leanne, for all of that. Um, what I, what I, what like really struck me is, um, you know, sort of centering the conversation really on uh, this notion that we can all agree that at the end of the day, we care about kids um, and kids being safe and well cared for. Um, I submit that kids do best uh, when they are safely and well cared for um, by their families in their communities. And so to the extent that we can um, sort of center that and think about um, our task in the context of that, I think will be really important because I think that you know, there, there is a, there is for sure an adversarial nature um, of child welfare um, in large part because, um, you know, child welfare is a, um, it, 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 it is heavily regulated and also requires legal proceedings, right? So um, the, it, it, it is, it exists within this structure that necessarily then creates sort of adversarial roles. Um, so to the extent that we can um, be thinking about these challenges, issues, concerns, and ultimately um, solutioning around some recommendations, um, reframing this work in the context of, at the end of the day, kids doing best uh, when they are safe and well cared for in their families, in their communities, um, and in what ways could uh, this task force uh, in its narrow work, um, really sort of support um, the best outcome to that end um, as possible is, is I think a way of moving away from that adversarial mindset. Um, uh, but I, 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 I greatly appreciate you naming that because um, it is one of the challenges that we have in this space. Awesome, Doris, thank you. I, yes, ma'am. Sorry to jump in. Um, I, I got a note from Sam that Sam wanted to clarify her um, her kind of goal. So Sam, I just, I know we've limited folks ability to chat to the group uh, for purposes of the public meeting. So just wanted to give Sam a chance to, to clarify a little bit, Sam, if you're comfortable awesome. with that. Thank you, Trace. Yeah, I just wanted, um, so I had said like my goal is like the disproportionate representation and not just in the hotline, but in the assessment. But I just wanted to be clear. I believe we meet that goal via specific implicit bias training. So not just in general, 
Um, and so I had said to Trace, one resource um, that I had heard about that another state was using was the intercultural development inventory. And so all of their assessment workers were taking that inventory and learning where they are on that continuum and then leaving with that plan. And so that's something that it's a tool I personally love and, and utilize personally in my DEI work. But I, I think what my hope is not like we check a box that says people have implicit bias, but that there's concrete training. So in, in the reality that can address the disproportionate representation. So I just want to be clear, um, the training piece was, was my hope. Awesome, thank you, Sam. All right, Kevin. I uh, I feel like everybody said a lot of what I want to say. There's a lot of good ideas in here. Uh, so I'll keep it short and just say uh, that I hope that we are able to sort of increase the clarity around the laws and the practices and also reduce uh, the harm to both youth and adults uh from what i see sometimes as unintended consequences of this law um and i know that we are all here in an effort and help to protect both adults and youth uh in in looking at this law in ways that it impacts people um and so i'm really looking forward to uh, just kind of getting more clarity around the practices awesome thank you dr wells yeah, it's, it's uh, gosh, this is a great group, right? I mean, it's uh, really um, inspiring to hear the different perspectives. And I and I think for me, a couple of things that stand out are um, honestly bold innovation, right? Like I, I don't think anybody wants to be a part of this group for you know the period of time that we're all committing together and not have outcomes. And, and I agree with you, Doris. I think that we have the group here to, that, that that's really gonna be unlikely. And so how do we then leverage something that really allows us to be bold and impactful? Um, I think a couple specific things for me that stand out, I think listening to, I think it was Lori who was talking about the accuracy of reports. Um, it, it really resonated with me as a, as a healthcare provider that worked in, in a system where um, I would see kids that were referred to child welfare. And I often had access to read the report that came into the hotline. And, it, and then sometimes even talk to the provider that made the report and, and there was a disconnect. And, and it's hard to know, right? Is the disconnect just what that person thought they were saying or what was drawn out? But that's such a critical time. Um, and it's such an important time to get it right. That um, as I think Stephanie was saying, I mean, this is, this is the door to everything. And so when that door is knocked on, how do we make sure that the information that is gathered is accurate is thorough because we may not have a chance to go back to that mandatory reporter for a host of reasons. So I think that's really important because the stakes are so high. Um, I was um, I had the good fortune of being part of the Child Welfare Action Committee. Um, Stephanie remembers this well, where things like the hotline came out of that. And yet I think we have an opportunity to get even bolder than that. Um, because I think it's really important to get that first, you know, in medicine, we think about it, the 911 operator, right? And when you call the 911 operator, you really hope that they're going to get it right in terms of what you're trying to communicate the need being. This, the other thing is, I think it's really important that we have measurable um, ways to measure how we know uh, what we did is going to have an impact. And so I, I think it's okay to say, Let's put some things in place. Let's have some ways to say, how will we know that this has the impact that we intended? Um, and when will we be able to, re, you know, can we reassess to say, well, we got it mostly right, but it's okay if we go back and we tweak something here and there. Um, I, I feel like this is a lot of, this is a, just an incredible group and it's an amazing opportunity to lead the country, but to be willing to say, let's, whatever we put in place, let's put some indicators so that we know, um, did we hit the mark or not? And if not, can we go back and tweak some things so that we do hit that mark? Awesome, thank you for that, Dr. Wells. I love the inclusion of, uh, that you're thinking about, um, you know, both the adaptive nature of, you know, that, they're, that we're gonna spend a lot of time together. We're gonna be really thoughtful and thorough and 
there might still be some blind spots. And so, um, you know, venturing out in, into this work, recognizing that um, we want to have an opportunity to just sort of check and see, like, did this have the impact that we thought? Um, and if not, is there an opportunity then to, um, you know, to make some adjustments? Uh, this is adaptive work, meaning that there's not like, there's not a pathway that we can just point to. There's not a statute from another state that we could say, why don't we just adopt this? Um, that would make our work, you know, three months time, not 12 uh, or not, not, not two years. Um, and, you know, so, you know, again, wanting to, to have the ability to be like really thoughtful and also, you know, acknowledging that, um, you know, there might be things that we just didn't think about or um, that didn't have the kind of impact that we anticipated. Uh, so I appreciate you naming that. All right, Jessica. Um, so I love everything everybody's been saying. I especially have to agree with Monica about, you know, making this um, something concrete. I think if there's something that I would look back at and really be proud that we made the transformation of, it would be a, <clears throat> a, like a strong and a workable bill for the legislature to actually um, institute statutory changes, um, particularly around, I mean, what we've been talking about, right? Clarifying what are, what are the elements of failure to report. And, and really, when I kind of put it that way, I my like broader hope is that we create that statutory change. We, we, we come up with um, recommendations that end in a great bill to make that statutory change that results in no mandatory reporter ever landing you know, on a DA's desk again for failure to report because it's so clear what the duty is. You know, in my experience, um, reporters, mandatory reporters are rarely, hardly ever nefariously failing to report. It's a mistake. It's a lack of training. It's a lack of understanding. Unfortunately, the consequences of that can sometimes be devastating, particularly when you're working with child victims or, you know, or teenage victims of sexual assault who were not heard and felt like they were not believed and nothing was done for them. Those are the terrible consequences of that failure to report. But it's, like I said, hardly ever, I think, extremely rare that it's done nefariously because we're all we're talking about a population of people who, like we've said, have dedicated their career and their their goals are all about prioritizing the health and safety of children. And so I want the law to be very clear for them so that we, we barely ever see that failure. And I want them to therefore have the support in training, especially when it comes to some of that, um, you know, some of that more comp those more complex subjects like sexual crimes, um, like teen dating violence, have the training to understand um, what sort of trauma the victim and survivor is going through, what sort of counterintuitive behaviors that they might exhibit, um, you know, so that a mandatory reporter doesn't go, well, I just don't believe it. You know, it's he said, she said. Personally, that's my least favorite term on earth. Um, and I, I really, I hope that because this population is such a trusted population that we actually give them the support mm -hmm. to maintain the responsibility of that trust that, that we instill on them. And so um, that's my hope. I'll be really proud if we can come out with recommendations that the legislature takes. And I think I echo everyone here that I think because of the um, amount of expertise on this task force and uh, the, the tasks that were really well defined in the bill um, for us to complete that we will have the ability to do that. And I'll look back and say, yay, we did that. Jessica. Jennifer. Wow, it is really hard to keep adding on to all of um, what everyone has said. And I'm just really, really impressed and really, really appreciating it. And I'm kind of glad to follow Jessica being another attorney to talk about statutes. <laughs> But, um, you know, I just, I want to see like a meaningful paradigm shift. I think that's what we're looking for is it really just changing the way we think about mandatory reporting, mandatory reporters, child welfare response, how all of that, that works. But there's, there are training pieces of this that are, that are critical. I think that, um, 
implicit bias training is top of my list for for training along with domestic violence and um, and that trauma informed piece. You know, I I think we miss that so much, and I think um, I didn't write down who who said this, but you know, really thinking about the way parents are are behaving with a trauma informed lens is is such a critical part of of all of this work but we need at the end of the day what we need are statutes that are really clear and the reports are only being made when they absolutely have to be when it's really important when a child is really in danger that we're not casting such a wide net and and i see this every single day because our advocates are mandatory reporters you know that the 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 slightest mention of something that may be child abuse or neglect, um, we're reporting because it, the law is too vague and it's too broad, and um, we are putting parents and children in danger. I think every day because when we make a report that says an abuser did something to a child and a child welfare person knocks on that abuser's door or they don't and someone has said hey by the way a report got made we are we are creating more danger and we are putting more parents and children in in harm's way every time we do that um and then the last thing i want to say is i just i love stephanie's statement of right sizing child welfare that that really just kind of captures um all of it for me like let's make sure that that mandatory reporting from the angle of who's a reporter, when are they required to report, what does the statute say, what does child welfare do when they get a report, is really focused on the right things and on and on the right kids. Awesome, thank you, Jennifer. Jade, yours. Sorry, can I? I'm going to jump in just real yep. fast. I just want to make a quick note that if there's any m member of the public that is intending on public comment, if they could just send me a note. Um, cause Doris, I'm just looking at our time and just want to make sure yeah. I have a heads up. So if you're a member of the public and you want to give public comment, just send me a, a note on chat and that way I can track it. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, I appreciate that. Jade. All right. I'm happy to go after Jennifer cause I was going to build on some of the same things around, uh, right sizing the child welfare system. I think it's, it's right sizing that and also the role of child welfare. I agree with what Michelle said, in order to do that, we have to have statute change around what is child abuse and neglect and really those definitions. Um, but I think a key part of this is differentiating in some way the role of the child welfare system from all of the other support and resource systems that are um, in our communities. And so if we call that a family well-being system or a family economic security system, all of those, I ultimately think that some of um, what happens is we're sending all families to child welfare. Child welfare has the power to remove my child and is not the place that I am going to tell about my substance use, mental health, IPV concerns, because of the risk and the fear associated with that. And so I think we need to be really thoughtful around kind of the role of child welfare and right-sizing that but then also using this as an opportunity to address or decrease or remove the barriers that are preventing families from seeking or receiving support from those advocates and services that can actually help them address whatever the underlying concerns are in their families that might result in child safety concern issues. Uh, one more comment. I also think there's a big public awareness and public perception component of this. And so it's one thing to change laws or to look at what the statute says, but at the end of the day, there is the public perception around who I talk to and if I'm safe to talk to this person or not, if I can get resources from this person or not. And if we don't kind of address that side of it, um, then I'm not sure that we will be as successful as we could be. Awesome, thank you, Jade. Ida. Yeah, I um, I. I love all this thinking and and um, thinking about the possibilities gets me really excited. I think fundamentally, um, really uh, understanding not just the policy as it's written or as it could be written in terms of clarity, but really reconsidering um, the underpinning philosophy behind the policy of mandatory reporting. Um, this idea that um, mandatory reporting must be done in secret, 
um, that your name is protected, that you are a surveillance mechanism on behalf of child welfare. I think that that role gets people in a really twisted up um, type of, of situation where there's fear on both sides, not just related to the child safety, but related to their own livelihood. And anywhere you see fear as the main byproduct of a policy, I get really concerned. And I also see um, the ways in which uh, the sort of the distortions have occurred over time. I think it's an outdated policy. I think it's based on uh, the premise that, that parents can't be trusted to provide safety for their children. And I would love to see us rewriting a policy that speaks to mandated supporting if we have to mandate anything um, to echo some of the uh, the other good thinking from the jam board um, and that we recognize that child safety is best provided for in the context of a child's family most of the time um, and that um, the the uh, mandated reporting is just one or reporting to child welfare is just one way that families can be supported. And so we need to think through um, how often that, that method of quote unquote support gets used. Um, uh, and so excited to make these changes. Thinking through policy is one thing, but I think for um, in child welfare, the issue has always been um, related to discretion that you can put about the most fine fine point on a policy and it still will not be clear. There will be room for um, discussion and adaptation. And that's where people that mirror this compilation of uh, professionals and people with lived experience across the state will continue to make decisions, um, hopefully in partnership with children and families about what is needed um, to provide for child safety. Awesome, thank you, Ida. Dr. Wilson. Ida, you and I just keep getting back to back, either me first or you first. How funny. Um, anyway, I, you know, I, I'm very cognizant as I'm sitting here listening to everybody talk that we have this rare opportunity to rewrite the cultural legacy for the children and families of Colorado. And so I just see that as a huge privilege. But I also think that since I'm limited to two things, the two ways in which we do that is we have to dismantle this current system because it has caused more harm um, than help. Right. And so I think the way that we do that is we we start to overlay this lens of equity in everything that we do, because in my mind, if a policy isn't deemed equitable, it shouldn't be deemed effective. Right. Um, systems are designed to get the very outcome that they get. And so in order for us to get something different, we're going to have to redesign it to get something different. Um, so I think there has to be an intentional alignment between the intent and the impact between research policy and practice. Those things have to be interwoven together because if we're out of step, when the, the folks that are supposed to be implementing the policy, they're gonna get it wrong, right? And so then the intent and the, the impact don't line up and then we cause harm. And so for me, I got in this field 28 years ago to help and not to harm. And so if this is truly a helping system, we gotta look at how it was designed and we do that by overlaying equity. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Don. So I think obviously clarity has been mentioned millions of times. Part of the reason for that is because we need to understand that in various systems, um, any kind of report can trigger secondary systems actions, right? And so in the childcare industry, even an unfounded report that was a self-report on a child who was left on the playground for one minute was discovered as soon as they got to the classroom, no harm, no hurt, no injury, nothing, right? That can trigger action from um, the Department of Early Childhood um, as a follow-up action to, to what you guys do um, that could have lasting implications for years to come. It could, could potentially result in monthly visits and probation and all kinds of additional issues um, that don't center around that um, claim of abuse and neglect. And so it's just really that clarity is so critically important because it is the, the door that opens to all of those other systemic consequences. Awesome, thank you, thank you for that, Donna. And I think that that, that relates um, in part back to what 
uh, Dr. Wilson was saying in terms of just sort of it, providing an example of thinking about intent and impact. Um, so thinking about all those collateral impacts um, to kids, families, systems, organizations, um, as we think about this work. All right, Chris. We have just a few more, just a handful more, and then we'll open up for public comment. So I, I really like everything that I'm hearing. Um, and again, being from a small community, we have so many barriers. Um, I really like, so my huge word is going to be, and I've heard it in so many different ways, but if we could destigmatize what a mandatory reporter is, because I just said it best, it should be mandatory supporter. You know, what we're trying to do is get the families involved or get help to the families um, because we're concerned. And these are our concerns because this is what we're seeing here. Um, you know, if we change the language, you know, we changed mental health to behavioral health, you know, or is that supposed to destigmatize, you know, the trauma aspect of it more or less? I don't know. But what we see here is a continuum of generational people that or families that have been mandatory reported. And so the system isn't working because we're not giving the resources to these families and therefore then their kids grow up and we report them and then, you know, and it's on and on and on and on. Um, we also have a problem here with, um, because where I live, we have a lot of migrant community. And so mandatory reporting gets difficult because of um, fear of deportation. And so, um, you know, I think that something has to be in place where there is no consequence regardless of your status. I don't know that there is currently, um, but you know, that we're dealing with one issue and not involving other issues. So that again, we're supporting these families in need. Um, I have a lot of people who are first generation and I get a lot of clients that tell me their stories and their parents are like, well, this is how I was raised. Well, you're not living in the United States when you were raised that way. And so it's very different from our culture here. Um, lastly, I would really just love to see this as a living, breathing document that keeps evolving because our laws change, our technology changes, the world around us is changing. We never expected a pandemic yet here it was and you know like we can't even like tell what's going to happen tomorrow so i'd really like to see that we continue to work on this or you know meet like back up after it's done like every year or something like that to ensure that it's still relevant and what's in it so i love that you have decided that you want to spend time with this group in perpetuity um Everybody must have made like a, an amazing uh, first impression, uh, but no, appreciate um, uh, your candor and feedback on, um, on on the opportunities that exist here. All right, Colleen. Absolutely, I will be very succinct and quick because everyone has said many of the things. I think there are three things that um, would demonstrate that that we have kind of transformed. Um, one is clarity, one is ensuring equity, and one is ensuring that our responses are indeed trauma-informed. Um, I don't think policy has the understanding of empathy. When you write black and white words in a policy, it does not understand empathy, nor does, does it really truly understand what trauma-informed looks like, um, and it doesn't understand equity in practice. And so if we can look at those things from that view and understand what that looks like in practice as we implement policy, I think that will be transformative in how we think about the work that we have in front of us for the next two years. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Colleen. Renya. Great. Um, I will just add a talent perspective, again, coming from the out of school space um, and being one of the support services. Um, not necessarily directly in child protection. We need to make it simple so people can understand. You shouldn't need a law degree to interpret a mandated reporting statute. Um, and I, so I think from that lens and that perspective, if we can make it supportive, clear, simple, and actionable and consistent, we will have wins, wins, wins. Awesome, thank you for that, Brenya. Just two more, Ashley. It's so hard to go at the end. I mean, you could just say ditto and like mic drop. But I'll <laughs> add a few more words. Um, 
the two things that come to mind for me is that at the end of the day, we want this to be simplified, which I think gets to the clarity that everyone is talking about. And I think of it as very targeted that we become a scalpel rather than a blunt instrument. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Bring it up the rear. Adriana. Looks like oh, you changed faster. spaces. I did. Sorry about that. It just technology was fighting me this morning. So I've lost the battle, but we'll win this war. Um, no pressure going at the end and I will keep it very brief. Um, I agree with all the statements that have been made here today and just wanna add how exciting and awesome it is to have 33 people come together with a very similar mindset. While we might not agree with every specific point that's being made or stated here today, um, it's not too often that task force groups come together with this much enthusiasm and passion on day one. So um, just want to point that out and um, say how exciting that is. Awesome. Thank you. I said you were last and you had all this pressure and then remembered that I needed to come back to Jill Cohen. Um, so coming back to Jill and then that's for real, for real, um, our, our last one. Thank you for letting me gather my thoughts. I'll just say, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, I will say a, a, a statute that decreases fear and increases transparency would be my two most important uh, takeaways. Thank you. Oh, look how succinct that was. Thank you, Jill. All right, I'm gonna hand it. Thank you all for your your best thinking um, on the fly and in, um, in coming up with your biggest hopes for this work. I'm super excited. Um, there was a lot of alignment and I think um, some nuances that uh, will be important to unpack in the uh, in the months and months and months to come. I'm now handing it over to Trace. Thanks, Doris, and thanks, everyone. Um, we do have a number of folks with public comments, so I want to just name a few things. Um, if you can keep your comments within two minutes, that's kind of what we're going to aim for, just based on the number of folks that have reached out. Um, and I do just want to note that this is public comment, and it's in and, and just with the way that this uh, conversation is going, there's not going to be a chance for dialogue right now, uh, but it is comment for the task force to consider as we, um, you know, continue setting um agendas moving forward so just want to name that piece as well so let's i'm just going to go down the list in the order that i received comments um kristen jones hi um sorry i do actually have more of a question than a comment and um so maybe somebody can answer me later but um i have kind of a process question my um understanding is that i'm a journalist writing about um, mandatory reporting um for a book project that i'm working on uh, my understanding in the in the lead up to this task force is there are some concerns about um, the people who represent sort of mandatory reporters outweighing the people with experience in the system. And uh, my understanding of how that was addressed was that there are supposed to be five people on this task force who are specifically um, uh, speaking with um, representing their own lived experience. Um, and so I'm wondering, and I only heard four of them identify themselves. I just wanted to confirm that there are actually five on the task force. Thanks, Kristen. Or go ahead. Kristen, now this is Beck, and I appreciate your question. I believe a full roster is posted on the website. If not, we can get that to you. But if you'll also drop your contact information to trace in the chat, uh, either one of us or we'll make sure somebody from uh, CPO gets in touch with you about that question. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Yep. Thanks, Kristen. I'm going to move on to David Hansel. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Hansel. I am uh, with Casey Family Programs, which uh, you probably are all familiar with, but it is a, a national child welfare foundation that works with uh, child welfare agencies and communities around the country uh, to help them better serve uh, children, families, and communities. Uh, and my role is um, senior advisor for child welfare policy. So I get to work with uh, organizations and communities around the country. Um, as a non-Coloradan, I mostly want to thank all of you for your commitment to this very, very important topic. Um, and I do think, uh, given uh, the, what I see as a national perspective that has been, has been said many times, the work you do here through this task force can absolutely have national implications. Um, as Doris said earlier, the dramatic racial disproportionality that we see in child welfare systems across the country begins at the front door. It begins with the families who are reported 
to child welfare agencies. And most of that is due to mandated reporting. Um, and then that continues through systems and through families' involvement with child welfare and child protective systems. So uh, mandated reporting is gonna be critical, I think, and what you do is gonna be critical to addressing racial disproportionality in Colorado and across the country. Uh, there's so much to look at here. There are three items I wanna suggest you may wanna focus on. Um, one is to acknowledge that um, mandated reporters are not homogeneous. They represent many disciplines with different cultures, different programmatic responsibilities, different standards. And, and so it will be important, I think, to look at each different category of mandated reporters and to develop standards and guidance for them uh, to make sure that they are uh, using mandated reporting only when appropriate and necessary, um, and that they have alternative ways of getting families connected with services outside of uh, child protective systems. Second is to look at the penalties that attach to failure to mandate to report. Um, I think we can all agree uh, that mandated reporters are designated because we want them to exercise their professional judgment. Um, and I think uh, often the penalties that are associated with failure to report can chill the exercise of that judgment. I, so I think it will be important for you all to look at the penalties that are associated with uh, failures to report. And the third, as I always mentioned, is neglect definitions. Um, the bulk of reports, of course, are for neglect. I think they have the greatest potential um, for over-involvement of, of families in the child protective system. Uh, the, the conflation of, of neglect with poverty is something we're all very familiar with. So I think looking at how the state of Colorado defines neglect is something you'll probably want to take a look at. Um, and let me just by close by saying that uh, Casey Family Programs um, stands ready to assist you in your work in any way that we can. And again, thank you all for making the commitment to this very, very important task. Thank you, David. Thanks for being here. Um, all right, I'm going to move. So I have a comment. Noel, I see your comments in the chat, and um, those are just directly to me. And so if you are comfortable um, and want to read that as public comment, or I can also read that, but you just let me know what you'd prefer. Sorry, um, I'm happy to share it. I'm here both as an adoptive parent and a special needs parent. And I'm sorry, it's, I'm kind of emotional about it. It's a big topic for me. Um, and I'm, I'm here to represent myself and I'm also here to represent other adoptive families because I know a lot of them. And um, the system is under representing and failing um, adoptive and special needs families similarly to the way that it's failing um, people, families of color and poor families. And um, there's a lot of uh, lack of understanding about special needs kids and especially children who are born with reactive attachment disorder, which is a majorly growing population in our society in part because of drug use and um, uh, and in part, because there's a lot of kids in the system who are, are not learning how to attach with people. And in our case, we have a son who made false accusations against my husband who does have reactive attachment disorder, um, the son, not my husband. And um, the school sent both the police and the uh, CPS to our house. And that was really overwhelming for a very innocent family to welcome a police officer into our home, um, knowing that we had nothing to be scared of. And CPS said that there's no charge. And then the officer went ahead and said that the words of the son was enough to charge my husband with a misdemeanor, even though there was no evidence. Not on. We have five children. There was no evidence that any of them had been abused. And this has completely um, turned our family upside down. It has done more harm than good for school resource officers in particular to not understand special needs children, which we tried to explain to her and she was not interested in learning. So I would like to see um, that would be my input to have these agencies come together in understanding special needs kids and especially kids with reactive attachment disorder. Um, and if they show up, at least send them together so that they can kind of have each other, you know, just kind of check each other. Because I guarantee if there had been a social worker or a DCFS going with the policeman that things would have turned out very differently for us. And um, fortunately it was against my husband and not me because I'm also, um, a, 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 I'm a, an LPC, 
I'm a mental health worker. And if I had lost my license, I mean, I, I would be devastated. It, it, the officer did not care to learn about special, you know, about anything. And my husband has a security clearance and we could have lost his job. We're still in the process of going to court right now. And he could have lost his job and a family of seven could have wound up on the street without my husband to provide for us. So I'm just here to say that these, agents need, these agencies need to work on being trauma informed and even understanding because police officers, I mean, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail and they came here to work with criminals, not families. And if they're gonna work in schools, they need to understand children and families and, and come from that approach that somebody mentioned of, of protect the children by protecting the families. And our family wasn't protected. And as a matter of fact, it cost so much trauma for our son who carries this weight of knowing that it wasn't true. And whenever he gets upset now, he says, um, you know, I'm going to go call the cops on you. And anytime he's upset and doesn't want to have to do a chore or something. So I'm sorry if I took too much time, but that, that's my feedback. I don't apologize, Noel. We really appreciate you being here and sharing your perspective. I'm seeing a, a number of uh, chats to me in the comments from task force members thanking you for being here. Um, and also, if you could share your email um, with me so that we can continue to send you updates from the task force as we go along. Um, the Ombudsman Office also reached out and said they want to make sure you get those updates. So um, appreciate you being here and sharing your perspective. Um, last person I'd like to, and I'm not totally sure if they would like to share a public comment and Lonnie, I apologize because I'm having a hard time tracking, but um, Lonnie, if you wanted to introduce yourself and share any comments, we do have time for that. All right, I'm not hearing from Lonnie. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, here. Here we are. <clears throat> Sorry, Trace. I'm Lonnie Gutro. I'm Olivia Gant's grandfather. I don't know if y'all familiar with her case, but I'm hoping y'all seem like a highly credible group of people that are going to get this mandatory reporting fixed because it uh, completely failed my granddaughter. And uh, I really can't say any more than that. Thank you. Thank you, Lonnie, for being here and for sharing your comments. I really appreciate that. If you also, Lonnie, if you want um, as well to be uh, kept up with any updates, please feel free to send me your email and we'll make sure we put you on the listserv as well moving hey, forward. You. Of course. Okay, so I, that is all I'm seeing for public comment. Is there anyone else that, I, that I'm missing uh, from, from the public that wanted to make a comment before we close? All right, well, thank you all for, um, for your comments and I'm going to hand it um, over to Stephanie to close us out. Great, thank you, Trace, um, and and thank you all. Um, you know, <laughs> we are four minutes before closing, and um, I just want to thank you. I I honestly always tell people um, I'm only smarter um, because of all of these conversations and the um, really the privilege um, of being here with all of you. Um, I do want to take a moment and to acknowledge Noel and Lonnie. Thank you for sharing. Um, your experiences, albeit briefly, um, period. Um, <laughs> um, it touches my heart. And um, again, um, I know that this group is here, not just for the mental or the intellectual challenges, right? Um, to look at law or statute and fix that, but also um, because of the families and children that are touched by this system every day. And you really um, drive that point home to all of us. So thank you both. Um, you know, just in terms of moving forward, um, I, I am humbled and I am honored, and I mean that. Um, as we move forward, um, a couple of just logistical things. One, as um, Doris um, so beautifully stated, um, you know, this is an adaptive process. This is an organic process. Um, I always, as part of my work on task force, reach out to individual members as we go, because uh, I just want to know your ideas. And uh, the time we spend on screen never gives me quite enough time uh, to dig as deep as I would like. So you can certainly expect some contact from me moving forward. Uh, the second thing I'd like to encourage you, um, I, my, my contact information will be in the Dropbox. Um, along with our facilitators, along with Jens, um, and really, 
we touched the iceberg today, right? And I know each of you have uh, resources to share, experiences to share, things that we can and will incorporate into this task force and the agenda as we move forward. So when I say it's organic, I, I say, please reach out to me, say, I wanna talk to you about a program I saw or a family I served, right? An experience I had. Um, these will go to inform the panels, the research, the data that's brought to this group. So please, please take advantage of that. Secondly, uh, Jennifer will be reaching out to each of you individually. We would like to put together a contact list and even a photo um, introduction uh, in our Dropbox, but won't do any of that without your permission and also understanding what is the correct contact information to put into that list. Uh, this is to encourage all of us to have conversations beyond our three hours uh, every other month. And um, I think that um, we'll be richer uh, for, for that as well. So Jennifer will be in touch with that. Um, with that, um, thank you. We will certainly be in touch. Uh, and Doris, any last comments uh, before we close? No, I, I said no, and then I'm going to say something else. So then I guess it's yes. Uh, it's just, I am so excited about the opportunity to work with all of you. Um, looking forward to um, not just facilitating, but really learning um, and, and helping to usher in what I think will be um, some important um, updates, changes um, in the state of Colorado for, um, again, uh, the betterment of kids and families and communities. So um, just looking forward and excited to join with all of you um, over the course of the next couple of years. Right. So we will be in touch. You will certainly be getting materials, future agendas, uh, minutes. Um, you do have um, access, I believe, to our website link where all of today's content is uploaded, right? Um, including this actual meeting recording, minutes, articles in the future, et cetera. So that is your go-to place for any and all information and materials. Um, and otherwise, I just want to wish you all a very happy holiday season and um, just uh, hope that you have an opportunity to enjoy yourselves and, and have some peace and we will be in touch. Thank you all. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.